All right, so we're actually at a couple minutes past our starting time, so I'm going to start here. Um, first of all, everyone, welcome. Uh, we're happy you are with us, and we want to see your real names and the pictures that I'm seeing all have what look like real names. If you look in the participants list and you don't find yourself, then you can rename yourself as of now. There's a couple people with just first names, and it would be nice to know your last name as well. Um, if you do want to rename yourself, you go to your name in the participant list and you click on the little camera looking thing and it'll say more or hover over it and it'll say more and then you can say rename or whatever. Uh, and I'm going to turn that off in a few minutes when I'm through talking here. So um, do that now if you want to. Um, our next, I'm, I'm Dan Mortensen. I'm the current chair of the Pacific Northwest section. And uh, I'll do some business things first, and then we'll get into our presentation. Our next section meeting is November 17th. And uh, James J.J. Uh, Johnston will present uh, what is bandwidth and why do I care? And uh, that is that that'll relate to digital recording as well. And uh, the website, uh, our, our section website with the information about that and the Eventbrite uh, thing will go live tomorrow afternoon, I think, so that uh, you can sign up there. Um, Let's see. Uh, and second, regarding that, I want to thank everybody who has donated money to our section via Eventbrite. It's very generous of you to do that. And uh, we'll use that to help our activities to, to pay our bills. And uh, just so everyone knows, again, there's no difference whatsoever in a ticket that's paid versus a free one but we will uh, welcome anybody who wants to do that. And that's really cool. We've been doing that for four meetings now, and we've generated almost 300 bucks out of that, which is a, a helpful thing to our group. Um, there is a Audio Engineering Society convention starting next week in New York City that is the first one since the pandemic. And I want to remind you of that. and suggest that if you're in New York or nearby New York, that it would be a fun thing to do to go by there. It's at the, it'll be at the Javits Center on the west side of Manhattan. I'm going. I'm curious if it, who else is, is no one else going here? Yeah, Just is anybody curious. else going? I'm gonna Raise your hand if you are something. Um, I'm going. This is Gary Gottlieb. I'll be going. I'll be there. All okay. right. I know that Lawrence Schwedler will be going. Lawrence, nice. Yeah, our um, our treasurer. Our treasurer. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right, I got a bunch of gigs next week, so I'm not going to be able to. I was going to go, blast. but I've got gigs as well. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I wanted to say that also that we are very insistent that we welcome members and non-members to our group. We're excited to have non-members, but we do encourage you if you're so inclined to join the Audio Engineering Society, because that's the entity that gives us the gravitas, the seriousness to be able to ask somebody to come and talk to us, somebody like Steve, to come and talk to us and spend their valuable time with us and explain things. And uh, the AES supports us and we support the AES. So we encourage you, but again, it's, we absolutely do. will always do our best to keep everything open to non-members as well. That's important to us. So today, um, in a few minutes, I'm going to turn off your ability to have your video on uh, or audio. And if you have questions, put them in the chat. And Greg Dixon, who's our moderator, will keep an eye on that and ask them as appropriate. It, at the end of the presentation, we will make it so that everybody can unmute yourself and we can see you and we'll go through everybody. We want to hear who you are 
and what you what you do in the world of audio and where you are because this zoom thing is a fantastic resource to be able to span the globe instantaneously and and be all together even though we're so far apart physically so uh we we want to hear from you later and have you tell us what's going on so please hang out as long as you want to and we'll go as long as we can i i got my booster shot today and i'm interested to see how long i'm going to be able to stay awake but uh uh we, we'll do that so is there anything that i forgot to say before i introduce greg who will introduce steve yeah dan yes gary um did you uh mention that everyone's supposed to mute their audio and video and if someone makes funny noises we're gonna shut you down uh actually i'm gonna make it so that you can't unmute your audio or video once we once greg starts talking and you won't be able to rename yourself either. I'm pretty sure that will work. If it doesn't, then yes, you need to turn your video off and keep your audio off or we will do it. And uh, uh, you will not be able to undo it until we change that. Anything else before we? Yes, uh, Dan, did you wanna say anything about tea time topic topics? Or did you? Sure. Already... Uh, we're, um, I, I do this thing on Saturdays from, uh, roughly 3 p.m. Pacific time to about 7 or 8 or 9 or 10 p.m. Uh, called Tea Time Topics because 3 is when I have my tea. And uh, uh, we talk about audio subjects of all sorts. Um, the next two are going to be um, hosted by Bill Gelhaus, who is here. Um, I've, I've got gigs the next two weekends. And uh, I think it's just going to be random discussion there. Gary's showing you a description that's on our website. Um, and that's actually out of date quite a bit. But anyway, it's it's really cool. And there's some really smart people. Raise your hand if you're a Tea Time Topicer who is here now. Uh, and we have a blast talking about really detailed stuff <laughs> and, and uh, things that projects that people have been working on. And there's presentations sometimes too, but the next two weeks will not be a presentation. So if you want to be part of that, uh, send me a uh, email in the chat, uh, send it to me directly, which you can do by selecting my name somewhere. And uh, we'll get you in on that. Anything else? Dan, you mentioned November 17th. Do we have a date for it in December as well? I'm sure I can find that online. But I'm just uh, December for is going to be Luke talking with, or Eddie Chiletti talking with us about something. And we don't have the date or the exact topic set yet. Okay. Um, we, we actually have all the meetings scheduled for the year, except for June. Um, not dates, but subjects, uh, which is pretty cool. So our plan is to announce the next meeting at the conclusion of the current meeting. So again, the December, the Jan November one goes live tomorrow and I hope to continue that. So after the November one, we'll announce the December one, et cetera, for the group. For committee people, we'll tell you ahead of time, but yeah. Okay, yeah. so now I'm gonna Thanks. go, somebody else have something? Okay. I'm going to and is your recording on again? Uh, I don't know. I think so. Yes. 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 Definitely. Okay. So I'm going to introduce Greg Dixon, who is a committee member who put this meeting together with Steve to introduce Steve. All right. Thank you, Dan. Um, we're very happy to have Steve Savenu uh, presenting tonight. Um, his presentation on the physics of microphones. Steve Savanio is a working production engineer with over 50 years of experience in audio and in, in the audio and video industry. He currently operates Buford T. Hedgehog Productions, which is an Ohio-based multimedia company. Uh, Steve brings with him a wealth of creative and technical knowledge 
Um, from years of experience working in the audio industry as a director at Audio Technica US, as a manager at Duquesne Corporation and international systems design engineer for Kitty Automated Systems or Kid Kitty. Um, as a professional audio and video engineer, he has been involved with a lot of major productions, including United States presidential debates, inaugurations, festivals, sporting events, papal visits, trade shows, and conferences. An accomplished location recordist, Steve specializes in orchestral, big band, jazz, and chamber music recording projects. And along with audio recording, Steve is very well versed in live sound production video acquisition and audio video post-production. Recently, Steve entered the world of event live streaming and has written articles on stepping up the stream to improve production quality. In addition to the presentation here tonight, Steve has taught his The Physics of Microphones workshop in other places such as recording and broadcast schools at the AES, the Society of Broadcast Engineers, SBE, and IATSE, International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, local chapter events. Uh, please welcome Steve Savenu. Hi, everybody. I'm going to uh, share my screen and um, share. Everybody that. who's not Steve should turn off your video, please. All right. So I don't see you guys anymore, which is because your video is off, it doesn't matter. So tonight, this is the physics of microphones. I call it applications and techniques for studio and live sound. And uh, as we said earlier, I run a company called Buford T. Hedgehog Productions. Um, I'm the executive producer here. I own the business. Uh, I've got 50 plus years now in the audio industry, as they said, so I won't get into all that. I am a working gigging sound guy. I use microphones almost every day in things I do. And I was formerly the director of educational services at Audio Technica. So with that, here's a brief look back at microphones. And uh, I'll tell you what, if you own any of these bad boys, you've got some, some serious cash tied up in them. I happen to own about a third of the ones on the picture. Um, I have no idea what that thing is next to Young Bing singing in that RCA 44B. Luckily for us, technology has improved thoroughly, and there's a ton of different microphones out there. Fortunately for us, the microphone manufacturers all pretty much use standardized uh, specification techniques and so forth, which makes it real easy to compare uh, microphones. And the microphones, I always tell people, are like the paint chips in a Sherwin-Williams store. How many shades of blue would you like? There's some classics in here. There's some new technology microphones in here. I'm going to try and kind of stay within the things that we know about. I'll touch on some of the newer technologies as well. And I'm open for questions and discussion definitely at the end. Oops. So microphones, believe it or not, still hold their value. They're one of the few things in our industry that does that. So I did some quick eBay searching on three microphones that I own. Uh, the NBC RCA 44B with the logo thing is about 3,800 bucks on eBay. The RCA 77, which if you can see in the background behind me, it's sitting on my uh, uh, edit station table, about 2,300 bucks on eBay. And that's like original KM84 uh, Neumann. And I've got 11 of those, 12 of those, and they're about 1,800 bucks a piece today. All those microphones are, some of those are over 50 years old and they still hold their value. Unlike some of the other technologies, think about that old DAT machine, that analog console, or that old desktop computer that's sitting in the uh, recycle bin at your place of, uh, of work. Uh, that's a Midas Heritage 3056 input console. I found it for $4,700 on Reverb. Uh, we all remember the nefarious Panasonic DAT machine and DAT machines in general, $49 on eBay. I think that was a parts machine. And of course, the IBM original Windows PC, nothing in the dumpster. <clears throat> this is kind of a bit of a fundamental, so it's going to be review for some people, and it may be some new stuff for others. I like to say that we're constantly learning, and I learn new things every day. So a couple of things I call these Steve's rules. Uh, first is signal to noise. We all know what signal to noise ratio is. It's a specification that we use in our day-to-day -day lives, but in the, the this uh, presentation, I'm looking at signals, the desired sound source, 
and noise is everything else. It's expressed in a ratio. So hopefully the signal tonight, when I do this live, the signal tonight is me talking and the noise is all the junk going on in the room around us. We all know what acoustical feedback is. And I usually demonstrate this when I do this class live, and I'm not going to do it here because I don't want to make my computer feedback. But acoustical feedback, that squeal, occurs when the sound pressure level of the amplified sound at the microphone is equal to or greater than the original source sound. And the classic example I use is you've got grandma at church on Friday or on Sunday, and she's talking about the fish fry, and she's holding up a classic handheld microphone about down here. And she says, uh, the fish fries Friday afternoon at three o'clock in the multi-purpose room. And of course, everybody in the, in the crowd says, I can't hear grandma. So turn it up. So the sound guy turns it up. And all of a sudden, this microphone, which is a dumb microphone, is um, picking up not only grandma's voice trying to do that, but also the sound that's coming back out of the loudspeakers, including all the noise in the room. And that starts an oscillation and that gets feedback. I always ask the question when I do this live, what are the two best microphones in the world? And somebody will yell out, you know, you know, Telefunken, Neumann, SM58. But in reality, it's this guy and this guy, your two ears. They're the only two microphones that can discriminate sound, meaning that I can tune out one type of sound or tune out one sound and listen in on something else. I could take the best microphone, the most expensive microphone in the world, set it up in a room full of people that are talking, and I could just get a bunch of jumbly noise. But standing in that same room, I can use these two microphones because they can discriminate, and I can pick out those really interesting conversations. So a little bit about uh, signal to noise and feedback. Recording versus live sound. I teach this class in a lot of recording schools. I like to say recording is creativity, experimentation, new techniques, and pushing the envelope. I also do a lot of live sound, especially festivals, where you've got 15 minutes between acts. You've got to get the first act off the stage and the second act on the stage. So I like to say in that case, live sound, it's damage control, preventing problems before they can happen. Get your money channels up and working and worry about the rest when you're into the first tune. So let's talk a little bit about the background of sound. This is a little bit of a review for a lot of us. The nature of sound, sound is pressure. It's vibrations that are transmitted through a medium. The most common medium is air. Another classic example of sound being transmitted through a medium is the little kid putting his ear on the railroad track and hearing the freight train two miles away because the vibrations of the freight train are being sent through the metal railroad, railroad rail. If I took my little alarm clock and set it off to ring and put it inside that bell jar and pumped out all the air, the sound would go away because there's nothing that that uh, alarm clock is going to vibrate within, within that bell jar. But if I move the edge of the bell jar, even with all the air evacuated out of it, and the edge of the alarm, alarm clock was touching the glass of the bell jar, I'd probably hear the thing because it's now vibrating the medium of the glass of the bell jar. We look at the sound wave, which is actually a three-dimensional thing in a two-dimensional way. We look at frequency, amplitude, wavelength, velocity or speed, and last but not least, phase. I won't go into these in detail, but frequency is cycles per second or hertz. Amplitude is how loud it is or how great it is that wave is above the baseline. The wavelength is the length of the one cycle of the wave, and the velocity is how fast it travels through the medium that it's transmitting, being transmitted through. And finally, phase is the relationship between two waves. When the two waves are in phase, they add together. When one wave is going up while the other wave is going down, they cancel each other out. The example I use is the racing roller coasters at Kings Island in, in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Interestingly enough, Frequency and directionality are also characteristics of the sound wave. High frequencies behave like that spotlight beaming in. Low frequencies, on the other hand, behave like a bare light bulb. So I'm standing on the street corner right next to the Space Needle, and I hear this guy in Seattle, Washington, coming down the street that's got the most kick-butt car stereo in all of the Northwest. And what do I hear first? The bass. Why? The waves are huge. They propagate forever. And they're pretty much omnidirectional. It's not until he gets right behind me at the intersection, I realize, based on the high frequency energy coming at me, that he's listening to heavy metal polkas. So high frequencies behave like a spotlight. 
low frequencies like a bare light bulb are more omnidirectional versus directional. We'll get to get to that a little bit in how we can utilize that directionality um, in, in applications down the road. So one of the things that manufacturers do is they represent the response of a microphone on the frequency response graph. It's a graphical representation of how that device reproduces the relative amplitudes of all of the frequencies that are presented to the device. Obviously, wider, low to high is better. Flatter, in most cases, is better. But a lot of microphones will tailor the response for a specific reason. They might roll off the low end, as you can see by the dotted line on my little uh, frequency response graph, to minimize the pickup of low frequency noise up through the mic stand or the cable. They might add a bump at the high end to add some airiness to the sound. That's all part of that coloration that makes every microphone a little bit different, i.e. the paint chips in the Sherwin-Williams store. The nice thing about this is, is all the microphone manufacturers have agreed on a standardized method in how they present their data. Unlike the amplifier companies back in the day when you could buy a boom box with a 10,000 watt amplifier in it, that was instantaneous peak power. That's the you got when you turned the thing on um, compared to others, which were some, you know, two watt RMS. But microphone manufacturers pretty much use standardized uh, nomenclature and standardized methodology in how they specify their products, which makes it easy for us to compare microphones performance and choose the one that's going to uh, do our application the best. Let's talk about the human voice for a moment. The human voice range is approximately 100 to 6 kilohertz, 100 hertz to 6 kilohertz. And it takes 80% of our voice energy to handle frequencies below 500 hertz. So that bass singer in that, uh, that quartet, he's using most of his energy to go below 500 hertz. There's also something known as the presence range, and that's between about 2K and 5K. And that's what maintains our intelligibility. It's key for dialogue capture. And it is what makes the voice sound near to you when you're talking to somebody. In the early days, microphone manufacturers added something called the presence peak in the response curve of their microphone. They tailored the microphone to enhance those presence frequencies. One of the most common microphones with a presence peak is the SM58. There's a slight rise about 2K followed by a dip about 3.5K, and that gives this microphone the characteristic that makes it very intelligible uh, for vocals and singing applications. It also helped compensate for the fact that the loudspeaker systems way back in the day, think of the Argos sound columns, were not capable of reproducing the voice range very well, so the microphones were tailored to help enhance those inefficient poor performing sound systems. Some microphones actually had a jumper wire inside the connector that when you use that jumper connection versus the other, the red wire versus the blue wire, by moving it on the pin, one of the pins in the output connector, there was a small presence filter that was engaged that caused that presence peak to happen. So the nature of sound, human voice, the presence range between two and five K. Now, We'll step away from the review of sound and we'll talk about the physics of microphones themselves. We'll talk about how they generate sound, how they capture sound, we'll make some connections, and we'll end with specialty microphones. We'll talk about some of the more interesting microphones that are out there. So first of all, a microphone's a transducer. It's a mechanical device that's gonna convert one form of energy to another. Our loudspeaker converts electrical energy to mechanical energy to acoustical energy. On the other hand, a microphone is going to convert our acoustical energy to mechanical energy to electrical energy. I always ask the question in the class, can a loudspeaker be used as a microphone? And the answer is, yes, it can. McDonald's may take your order, please. Would you like fries with that? Can a microphone be used as a loudspeaker? Well, back when I was a child, I had a little tape recorder, and it had a really cool little microphone that came with it. And one day, by accident, I plugged the microphone into the earphone jack on the tape recorder and hit play to play back my little tape. And lo and behold, I could hear sound coming out of my microphone. I thought, that's really cool. Got all my friends around, turned the output level of the tape recorder up to full blast and said, listen to this, and promptly blew out my little microphone. 
So yes, a microphone can be used as a loudspeaker, but I wouldn't recommend it. So here's an example of a speaker being used as a microphone. So I took an NS10 woofer, mounted an extremely heavy duty mic stand and set it out in front of the kick drum to get the subharmonics. I also had a dynamic microphone inside the kick drum to get the smack of the beater against the head. Yamaha actually took that concept, took a whole bunch of NS10 woofers that were lying around and mounted them in this little kick or little uh, drum shell shaped device. And they called that the sub kick. And I think there's a couple other manufacturers that make a similar product, but actually a, a woofer and a heavy duty mic stand will do the job just as well. Let's talk about the most common microphone that we use in our craft today, primarily live sound and in some studio situations. And that's a dynamic microphone. It operates using magnetic induction. It's a moving coil. It works like a motor. I have a diaphragm that's attached to a coil of fine wire that's suspended within a magnetic structure. Typically, it's wrapped around a paper core. That paper core floats over a magnet. The attached coil of wire moving over that magnet generates a small voltage. I don't need any power to operate this microphone. And I can um, basically do just about anything with this microphone. It's extremely rugged. So the dynamic microphone will take a lot of abuse. This is the infamous Electro Voice 664. It was also known as the Buchanan Hammer. And uh, the story goes that uh, the EV sales manager, Lou Burroughs, used to take this microphone out on his sales presentations, pull a two by four out of his briefcase and a few nails, and pound nails into this board with this microphone. I actually tried that with my 664. And other than nicking the chrome off the microphone, it didn't harm the microphone at all. The other one that lo a lot of people thought was the Buchanan Hammer was the uh, infamous 635A broadcast handheld dynamic. It was a rugged handheld. It took a lot of abuse by frustrated news reporters, but the Buchanan Hammer was actually the 664. There's a couple of broadcast versions of that. One is called the 666, and I think the other one is the 665. They are painted gray, and the uh, swivel base on the 660, um, 665 has an XLR connector uh, as opposed to the, uh, the Amphenol 4-pin connector. So pros of dynamic microphones, they're extremely rugged and they can take a lot of abuse. They'll also handle an unlimited amount of sound pressure. In fact, uh, Sennheiser used to market the uh, uh, 421 dynamic microphone by firing a starter's pistol off next to the microphone. And they said in their ads, it will take the sound of the starter's pistol firing off. What they didn't tell people was just about any dynamic microphone would also handle that uh, same sound without too much uh, problem. Dynamic microphones do not require any power to operate, although a couple of manufacturers have started to put some active electronics in a dynamic microphone to boost their outputs slightly. Dynamic microphones are also affordable. You can find a dynamic microphone for under $20 on uh, Amazon.com. It's probably not a very good one, but a good dynamic vocal microphone is about 100 bucks. The cons of dynamic microphones is they're not very sensitive. You need to be close to the microphone to really get it to, to work. They have fairly low output levels, although some newer dynamic microphones, the Beta 58, for example, as opposed to the standard SM58, uses neodymium or high energy magnet material that's going to give it more output level. Dynamic microphones don't handle transient response very well. And dynamic microphones, unlike others, are extremely difficult to miniaturize. The little photo in the lower right-hand corner shows a presenter using a dynamic lavalier microphone, similar to that little electro voice guy, that's about the size of a large lipstick container. He's got it hung around his neck on a lavalier cord, which is where the term lavalier microphone came from. <clears throat> The second type of microphone, which is probably the most common type of microphone in use today, if you count the microphones in devices like your cell phone and your computer, is the condenser microphone. And it works on a variable, variable capacitance electrostatic principle. We have an electrically charged back plate and an electrically charged diaphragm. They're separated by an insulating spacer and they form a capacitor. So air pressure 
air pressure hitting that diaphragm causes it to move. The diaphragm's movement in relation to that back plane varies the capacitance, and thus a very small electrical signal is created. And that signal needs to be amplified to make it useful. And that's where the uh, field effect transistor or the vacuum tube circuit in uh, vacuum tube condenser microphones comes into play. It basically boosts that small signal to something that's usable. It has to be close to the capsule because it's a very high impedance circuit from the output of the actual capsule to the, uh, the uh, uh, amplifier. Thus, that input to that amplifier can be very sensitive to static electricity. The classic example is the intern that's going to change out the capsules on a interchangeable capsule condenser studio mic. He unscrews the cardioid capsule on his uh, um, Audio Technica uh, 40 series, screws on the cardioid capsule, but in doing so, he shuffled across the room on the dry carpet, touched the little brass tip inside the microphone, and shorted out the uh, FET amplifier. That amplifier also requires voltage to operate, and that voltage can come from a number of different places, and we'll talk about those in a minute. And that amplifier may have an input pad, which allows the microphone to handle, handle higher SPL. Now, the capsule itself can take a fairly high SPL, but it's usually the circuitry in a condenser microphone that overloads that gives you the distortion, not necessarily the capsule. Now, externally biased or electret. An externally biased or true condenser, as they called it, gets the charge on the back plate from an external voltage source, either a power supply or a voltage up the microphone cable called phantom power, which we'll talk about in a minute, or some other source. That higher voltage is going to polarize the back plate. They say it provides a higher output or better signal to noise ratio. We used to call that a true condenser. A lot of your higher end studio microphones will be classified externally biased or true condenser. However, Electret technology has come a long way. Original Electret technology condenser microphones were considered inferior because the back plate was permanently charged by the manufacturer when the microphone capsule was manufactured. And some people say that over time, that uh, capsule can lose some of that, that charge. Um, technology has gotten a lot better on Electret microphones. All of your um, small Electrets that are in your cell phones, in your computers, and a lot of those devices are Electret microphones. The other benefit of an Electret condenser is they can be powered by an internal battery that powers only the electronics in the microphone. Most small condenser capsules, as I said, are electrets. And uh, believe it or not, the Audio-Technica 5040 and 5047 that have some fairly large diaphragms, those are all electret condenser microphones. And that's their boutique top of the line in the Audio-Technica product line. There's some other boutique style um, condenser microphones that are electrets as well. Uh, so electrets are becoming more and more popular in the higher end microphones. Solid state or vacuum tube. That defines the internal amplifier technology that's used in that microphone. Solid state microphones use a FET circuit. That's the amplifier circuit that's going to boost that output from the capsule. They typically have a standard XLR connector, and they can be powered either by a signal a voltage coming up the microphone cable called phantom, or they can be powered um, by an internal battery to run the electronics. Some people say that a solid state condenser microphone has a brighter sound than a vacuum tube condenser microphone. And typically, solid state condenser microphones are less expensive than their vacuum tube counterparts. Now, the vacuum tube counter, uh, vacuum tube condenser microphone was the original style condenser microphone. They required an external high voltage power supply to provide the plate voltage along with a uh, power supply to supply the filament voltage for the tube within the microphone. They also required a special cable between the power supply and the microphone. Some of the originals used a Tuchel style connector, which was a multi-pin connector. Some of the newer tube style condenser microphones use a multi-pin XLR style connector between their power supply and the microphone itself, which means if you're doing field recording using your tube mics, 
Don't forget that cable or else you won't be able to use the mic. Some people say the tube condensers do have a warmer sound. And of course, vintage tube microphones can be very pricey if you've ever looked any of those guys up. So the pros of condenser microphones versus the cons. Condenser microphones are typically more sensitive to sound than dynamics. They typically have a hotter output level than dynamic microphones because of the amplification that's inside the microphone. They also have a wider frequency response based on how the, uh, uh, the what it, it doesn't take as much energy to move the capsule, move the diaphragm in the capsule. And it will ha it'll typically handle a wider response. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Condenser microphones also handle transients better because it doesn't take as much energy to move the diaphragm. They have a better dynamic range and they're much easier to miniaturize. So all the little tiny lavaliers you see on newscasters and presenters today are more than likely condenser microphones. The cons to a condenser microphone is they do require some sort of a voltage to operate. Typically, it is the electronics in the microphone. High humidity can also affect the operation of condenser microphones. If you're in a very humid environment, or if you go from the cold car here in Ohio into a nice, warm, humid uh, concert hall with my microphones, they can get dew on them, just like uh, the old VCRs could get dew on the tape heads. And if the insulating spacer gets moisture on it, it can cause some shorting to occur between the diaphragm and the back plane. And typically when that happens, it sounds like bacon frying when you turn the mic on. The solution, if you run into that situation, is just to set the microphone in a little Tupperware with rice, and that will take the moisture out, and it'll dry out. It'll be fine. Real inexpensive condenser microphones, just by the nature of their design and their electronics, can be noisy. And yes, some condenser microphones can be fragile. I wouldn't pound nails with my Neumann KM105, although I do, when I do this demonstration live, uh, beat a condenser handheld vocal microphone on the table and it will take a little bit of abuse but i wouldn't do it wouldn't do that to either of those studio microphones that are on the left side of the photo so we've talked about condenser microphones we've talked about dynamic microphones and how they both generate sound let's talk about the third one and that's the ribbon microphone and ribbon microphones at one time were the mainstay of broadcast and the mainstay of recording back in the early days <laughs> And then ribbons kind of fell out of favor and condenser microphones became more popular. Then all of a sudden, ribbon microphones again regained their popularity. So why are ribbon microphones so popular now? Well, let's go back in time. Back in the analog days, we were taught to record hot and bright. We chose a condenser microphone with an extended high frequency response and on our Two inch tape machine, we pushed those level meters so they were just kind of jumping into the red, hot and bright, because we knew that every time we did a bounce down, we had something called generation loss and we would lose a little bit of high frequencies and we'd lose a little bit of level. We figured by the time we bounced down to the final mix, ready to go off to the mastering, we had enough high frequency level left because you always take a little bit away, but it's really hard to bring it back. So now we migrate over into the new digital realm, right? We've got our DTRS machines or our ADATs, remember those guys? And we have our nefarious DAT machines. I did a lot of location recording with two of those Fostex machines, a main and a backup, because I never knew which one was going to fail first. And of course, the DTRS machine using a little miniature Hi8 video tapes to get eight tracks on that, and the ADAT using the VHS tapes. So... All of a sudden, we're recording into this new digital domain. And I asked the question on my midterm, what happens when you do a digital bounce down on a, in a digital format? Nothing. And if you leave the question blank, by the way, you'll get it right. Because there's no generation loss when you do a digital bounce down. So guys that were taught to record hot and bright, they're finding that their recordings were starting to sound harsh and brittle because they were using those extended frequency response condensers, and they're recording hot and bright. So they discovered these microphones lying in the back of the microphone cabinet, these old ribbon mics. And manufacturers like Royer and AEA started to build new models of ribbon microphones because they found that ribbon mics had the warm low end they, we wanted, 
along with a silky or smooth top end without being extremely exaggerated in the top end. So ribbon mics, because of the digital world we're in, have become extremely popular. And there's a whole realm of new ribbon microphones. So what is a ribbon microphone? A ribbon microphone is the most fundamental type of transducer. I've got a corrugated foil ribbon suspended between the poles of a large permanent magnet. Now imagine taking a Wrigley Spearmint gum wrapper and peeling the foil off of the little piece of paper carefully. That foil is about how thick the ribbon is. It's actually thinner than a human hair. So this corrugated little ribbon is suspended in this big magnet. And of course, the early ribbon microphones were huge because the magnet technology back in the day was not as robust as it is today with the neodymium and higher energy magnet materials that we have today. So the ribbon suspended in the magnet, air hits the ribbon, causes it to move inside that magnet, breaking the magnetic force lines, inducing a very small voltage. A step-up transformer boosts that voltage to something that we could use. That step-up transformer actually matched the output of the ribbon microphone to the transformer uh, input on a broadcast recording console, like an old RCA or an old Western Electric. Interesting to note that that transformer also had something called a center tap. And I'll talk about that when I talk about power up a microphone cable. So these ribbon microphones with this thin ribbon, these big guys, gave me this warm, rich, silky sound. Now, the original ribbon microphones were extremely fragile. A small puff of, or a strong puff of air would destroy the ribbon. So somebody would walk up to your ribbon microphone and go, is it working? Oh, <laughs> not anymore. Any kind of voltage across that ribbon vaporized it. It was like a fuse. And of course, the original ribbon microphones needed to be stored properly which was vertically. If you laid your RCA 44B on its side or your RCA 77B on its side, over time that ribbon would sag and stretch out and that would affect the response to the microphone. Vintage ribbon microphones command a high price today and they're still in use. I have uh, two RCA 44Bs that I do use on occasion in my studio and they've increased in their value. Back in the day, you could buy a Sure Model 315 for about 200 bucks. And today they're uh, quite expensive, as are the old RCAs and, uh, and some of the other old ribbon microphones out there. I actually own three of the four on this, uh, on this little photograph. I don't have the 315 uh, uh, general purpose Sure ribbon microphone. Ribbon microphones are also known as velocity microphones because of the, uh, um, the ribbon suspended in the magnet. And they have a distinctive pickup pattern, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, hey, the newer Steve. model ribbon microphones hey, have, yes. Um, we have a question from the chat that relates to this, uh, to velocity that I thought now would be an appropriate time to okay. throw your way. Throw it away. Rod Evenson <clears throat> writes, the word velocity with regard to sound can have two meanings. One is the speed of propagation, approximately 343 meters per second. The other refers to the velocity of the air molecules moving the diaphragm, the voltage output of the, an unloaded ribbon microphone is proportional to the velocity of the air molecules, which is variable and not the speed of propagation of sound. Rod asks, is there a better way of referring to these different uses of the word velocity? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a good, good question. Um, I don't know of a different way. I mean, the original, I have a, an original Western Electric ribbon microphone that was called a velocity mic because it was the, the velocity of the molecules moving the ribbon. Um, I don't know. There's another term that I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, proximity, uh, which also has a, a number of different meanings in our world. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I, that's something I'll look into. Maybe if someone feels like they do have an educated or informed answer, maybe put that into the chat and we can talk more about it. Thanks, And Steve. we'll take an inspired guess as well. <laughs> okay. Okay. So back to ribbon microphones. So these old ribbon microphones with their transformer coupled fairly low output were designed to impedance match to a transformer coupled input on a broadcast console, 600 ohms. 
we started plugging these into our active inputs on modern day mic pre's and things. And we found that their outputs were extremely low. So companies like uh, Royer, Cloud, Clark Technic came out with devices that would boost the ribbon mic output or boost the output of a low level microphone into something that a modern day input circuit wanted to see. Ribbon microphone manufacturers are also putting active electronics in their microphones to allow the output of that mic to impedance match properly with today's consoles, mic preamps and things. Ribbon microphones today are using smaller and more powerful magnet structures, structures using exotic magnetic materials like neodymium. And a lot of them are, are incorporating special baffles and structures within the ribbon uh, itself to minimize the effects of wind. I actually have an Audio Technica 4080 ribbon mic. When I do this live, I'll blow into it and it won't hurt it because of micro mesh that they put around the ribbon, as well as the way the ribbon's Im Im imprinted. And there's some other structural um, pieces around that ribbon to protect it from uh, wind. But I still take uh, care when I'm using any of my ribbon microphones. Uh, if I'm in any kind of a a windy situation, for lack of better terms, I will put a windscreen on them, a foam windscreen just to help protect them. Uh, my RCA 44Bs only go in the studio. I don't take them out in the field. And I make sure that there's no voltage on any mic lines anywhere before I plug those guys in. Um, so ribbon microphones. Pros, smooth, silky highs without being exaggerated at the top end. And a naturally warm low end, you get a really nice, full, rich low end. Ribbon microphones are also good on transients because it doesn't take much energy to move that diaphragm. They can handle some fairly high SPLs. And unlike the fragile early ribbon models, the new models are much more robust. Cons, any voltage getting into the ribbon microphone via the, the output line can vaporize the ribbon. Older models are extremely fragile. They have a low output level. And as we know from just seeing photos of these guys, they can be physically large. So they're almost impossible to miniaturize. Although I do have a small ribbon microphone, RCA ribbon mic, that's uh, about the size of a, of a normal handheld vocal mic. So we talked about the three common types of microphones that we use in our world today, live and recording, broadcast. A couple others that you may run into is the crystal or ceramic microphone. If there's any harmonica players out there, uh, the classic uh, Green Bullet was a crystal microphone. Harmonica players liked it because they had a real mid-rangey bite. It was a communications mic. And you may also run into a carbon microphone on occasion, especially if you have a relative that's got the old telephone on the wall in their kitchen and you're talking to grandma and it sounds all crackly. Tell her to pound the handset on the counter for a few seconds, and that'll loosen up the carbon granules in the microphone element um, in her old telephone. So those are a couple of other types of microphones that you might see out there in the world. Let's talk about output level or open circuit sensitivity. This is how we measure the output level of a microphone. And by the way, this presentation is peppered with these stock photos of people with microphones. And I find these on these stock photo things, well, stock photo websites and buy them for a dollar a piece. And some of, them, some of them are absolutely hilarious. And you'll you'll see lots of bad singers and things. The photos don't really mean anything except they're kind of fun. So sensitivity is the amount of output for a given input signal. It's a standardized measurement that all microphone manufacturers use. And it's stated in two ways, either dBSPL or millivolts. In dBSPL, the less negative values, less negative means higher sensitivity. In millivolts, the higher value means higher sensitivity. And that's all based on a reference SPL of one Pascal, which is 94 dBSPL. And that's our standard for sensitivity measurements across the board for all manufacturers. So how do they measure the sensitivity? All right, I brought out my good friend, the world-renowned Mr. Fish who plays the triangle for the Philharmonic. Um, and he set up a measurement system. 
So we measure the microphone's output with a known audio input. And this is usually done in an anechoic chamber from a reference loudspeaker. It's a one kilohertz tone at 94 dB SPL or one Pascal. The measurement results are dB referenced to one volt, that's the negative numbers, and millivolts. Thus, the higher output was a more sensitive microphone. Uh, when I worked at Audio Technica, we would measure every 40 series and 50 series microphone that came into our facility in one of our two anechoic chambers. And they built and designed an automated test process that they the operator literally put the microphone in a mount. The mount had a was a was a fixed distance from that loudspeaker. Um, walked out, closed the door hit a button on the uh, test system, and it ran a cycle through a test procedure that measured its sensitivity, measured its uh, max SPL rating, and measured its uh, its response curve or its polar pattern, which was pretty cool. And that was a printout. A lot of the studio microphone manufacturers on the higher end microphones will include that information when you buy the specific microphone. So that's how we measure open circuit sensitivity. So if we take a look at different microphones. So I took a condenser microphone, two dynamic microphones, and two types of ribbon microphones. If you notice, the condenser microphone gives me about 15.8 millivolts output. It's a pretty hot microphone. That's a AE5100, and they know that that's one of their hotter condenser mics. Compare that to the SM58 with its uh, 1.85 millivolts of sensitivity. It's a much lower output microphone. So I got to crank the gain higher on my mic pre. Now, if I step up to a beta 58 with a neodymium magnet structure, so it's a higher energy magnet. So it's a, it's a stronger magnet structure, even though it's physically the same size as the magnet structure in the regular SM58, I get 2.8 millivolts sensitivity on that microphone. Go back to a classic ribbon microphone that's passive, 2.25 millivolts. And now I use an active ribbon microphone that has uh, amplification built into it. And that's 8.3 millivolts. So it depends on the microphone's construction, i.e. The, the magnetic material and dynamics. And it depends on what whether there's circuitry in it as far as the active mics. The sensitivity defines the amount of preamp mixer gain that's required to achieve a desired output. So the guy with his little Mackie mixer, I always love this scenario. He's been using dynamic microphones that he bought from the big box music store all of his life. And he heard, he read on one of the uh, blogs, music blogs, that if you get a condenser microphone, it's going to sound better than your old dynamic microphone. So he'd go out and he would buy a condenser microphone, a nice condenser microphone. And he'd plug it into his little Mackie mixer, but he had no idea what that little gain or trim control did at the top. He just always knew for his old microphone, it had to be about four o'clock. So he plugged in his condenser microphone without touching anything on his mixer, turned the fader level up, and all of a sudden it feeds back. Why? Because the condenser microphone's greater sensitivity or hotter output level required less preamp gain on his little mixer. He thought the microphone was bad, took it back to the music store and got his money back. But what can I say? Hey, Steve. Yes. I think now would be an appropriate time to forward you a question from Rod Evenson once again, asking okay. if you could <clears throat> maybe expand upon um, differences in preamp requirements between types of microphones. Um, is there anything more that you want to share about that? Like, well, I would different say kinds of preamps that you might need for these different types of microphones. Well, it's, you know, it's, I guess it's more or less what's the, um, you it, it's impedance matching to the output of the microphone. And most microphones are, the impedance output's pretty common, about 150 ohms. The uh, uh, preamp sensitivity, I do know that uh, there's some microphones that are extremely hot outputs and they have to be either padded down with an inline uh, attenuation pad, or they will overdrive the front end of some preamps. Um, but as far as do I need a specific preamp for a specific microphone? Not necessarily, as long as my preamp has got an adjustable input stage and potentially an input pad on the input stage. Does that make 
Does that answer the question? I think so. Maybe Rod, if you still have more questions, you can post them in the chat. Thank you, Steve. Or, or we could do, we could do it in the discussion afterwards. Um, but I do know there are some condenser microphones that have some extremely hot outputs. Thus, the uh, the need for uh, the the attenuator. Also, some of the original ribbon microphones with extremely low outputs. Uh, companies like uh, go back to the, the ribbon mics. These uh, little cloud lifters and deboosters and the CT ones were devices designed to uh, basically amplify the output of that ribbon microphone. Um, if I can get a hotter signal out of the microphone, I don't have to turn the gain up on the mic pre as much, meaning the noise level is not being brought up as high on the mic pre as well. So having a microphone that's got a little bit stronger output, I prefer, a say, a Beta 58 in some cases over a straight SM58 because it's got a little bit higher output or, or better sensitivity. So hopefully that, um, that helped answer that. Diaphragm size, big or small. A large diaphragm microphone typically has a capsule diameter greater than one inch. That's the cutoff point. Our classic studio vocal microphone, condenser microphone, one inch or greater diameter capsule. The larger diaphragm is going to give us more low end, just like a larger diameter loudspeaker is going to handle lower frequencies. It's going to give us a little bit warmer, more natural sound. Uh, large diaphragm microphones can also be. Uh, made available in multi-pattern configurations. And I'll talk about multi-pattern mics in a moment. A larger, thicker diaphragm is also more durable and higher SPL applications on a condenser microphone. Smaller diaphragm microphones are going to give us better transient response. They're going, to react, they're going to react quicker. A lot of people say a smaller diaphragm microphone is going to sound brighter with more detail, more articulation, and less coloration. I always say that uh, small diaphragm my, small diaphragm mics are my go-to choice for woodwinds, strings, and other delicate orchestral things when I'm doing orchestral work or I need to capture a lot of detail. Most of your measurement microphones are small diaphragm. I've got a set of uh, B&K measurement microphones that I bought at a flea market for a dollar a piece. I had them checked out when I was at AT. And I got the preamp that goes with them, uh, the BNK preamp for five bucks. And uh, the uh, QC guy there told me I had about $10,000 worth of microphones and preamp. But they're extremely flat, so they're not very musical. Um, most applications in the studio, you'll see large diaphragm microphones on vocals and maybe room mics, uh, acoustical instruments, and so on. Although again, it's like paint chips in a Sherwin Williams store. What color blue do you want? Let's talk about transient response for a moment. So I brought in Mr. Fish. He strikes the triangle. Ting. And I record it. I captured on this oscilloscope graph with a condenser microphone and a dynamic microphone. As you can see, the waveform on the condenser microphone is like the Ferrari leaving the traffic light. Zero to 60 in two seconds, stops on a dime if somebody runs out from between two parked cars. The dynamic microphone, on the other hand, is like one of those Seattle city buses, right? Zero to 60 in about two minutes, and heaven forbid if anybody runs out of a, between two parked cars, he's got to slam on the brakes. So that condenser microphone, because it doesn't take much to move the diaphragm, and the diaphragm, when the sound stops, the diaphragm is going to stop moving. The dynamic, on the other hand, because the diaphragm is connected to that coil of wire wrapped around a paper core, that motor, it's going to oscillate a little bit once the initial transient goes away. And you're going to see that oscillation in all those little bumps at the end of that little waveform. And notice that the waveform is also wider because it takes more for that dynamic element to respond that motor to respond to that transient, and then it's going to take more to decay it out. So condenser microphones on high transient type sound sources, pluck strings, hi-hat tapped things, dynamic microphones, not on those kind of things. 
proximity effect. And this is a term that uh, most of us are aware of. Uh, there's some people that talk about proximity in how a microphone behaves, and I changed that word, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And this is an interesting effect that happens as you move closer to the microphone and a certain type of microphone, the low frequencies will increase. And this is a Sure Beta 52 kick drum mics um, frequency response graph. And as you can see, as I it, as I get closer to this microphone, I get a boost in these low frequencies. And this happens in primarily directional microphones. And we'll talk about directionality in a moment. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's a dynamic or a condenser. So the closer you get, the more low end you get. It can be a curse or it can be something we can use to our advantage. A lot of AM radio folks will get up close to their microphone to get that big, deep AM radio sound when they're talking. Uh, we can use that on, if I want to enhance the low frequency response of my kick drum by moving that beta 52 in closer, I'm going to get more, more thump in the, in the drum. The microphones across the bottom do not exhibit proximity effects. So I can get real close on any of those and they're not going to give me that bass boost. Why? The first one's the Shure Dual Dyne and it's got a double element uh, configuration that's designed to reduce the proximity effect. The next three are omnidirectional. We'll talk about directionality in a moment. And the, four, the last one is that Buchanan Hammer and it eliminated the proximity effect by adding multiple ports on the microphone which basically um, controlled how the sound reached the back of the diaphragm. And I'll talk about that in more detail with directionality, which should be the next topic. So in a nutshell, how microphones generate sound. Dynamics, moving coil of wire, attached to the diaphragm, condenser microphone, a thin diaphragm separated by an insulating spacer from a charged backplate capacitor, Ribbon microphone, a very thin ribbon suspended in a large magnet velocity. Dynamics will handle unlimited SPLs. They don't require any power to operate, which is why you see them in a lot of field applications, in a lot of uh, broadcast applications, and a lot of live sound applications. They can take a lot of abuse, pounding nails, but they're difficult to miniaturize. Condenser microphones, primarily because of the amplification stages within them, typically have a hotter output, a much wider frequency response because the uh, doesn't take much to move the diaphragm and it will handle the transients better. They do require power to operate and they can be made extremely small. Ribbon microphones have a smooth top end and a rich low end. They will handle high SPL. Newer models are more rugged. The older models were quite fragile, and that's the typical big broadcaster studio microphone. I like to say choose condensers for most recording applications, dynamics for high SPL sound sources, and ribbons to tame that harsh digital edge, as Mr. Fish would say. So we've talked about how microphones generate sound. Let's talk about how they pick up sound, and that's known as directionality or the pickup pattern. And that's how the microphone responds to sounds coming to it from different directions. Omnidirectional favors all directions equally. Think of a, a sphere. A directional microphone favors a specific direction known as the on-axis direction, and everything else is known as off-axis. Interestingly enough, all microphones are born omnidirectional. And microphone manufacturers are going to engineer specific mechanical and, and acoustical designs to affect the directionality or the pickup pattern of the microphone. And they do that by using typically an acoustical labyrinth, which allows sound to enter a series of ports. So if you can see me as well as the, the uh, PowerPoint, I'm going to take the head case off of my SM58. And right below the capsule is this little ring with this mesh around it. And that's the entrance to the back side of the diaphragm. And sound going into this is going to go through an acoustic labyrinth within the head of this microphone. It's going to acoustically delay the sound wave hitting the back of the diaphragm as opposed to the sound wave hitting the front of the diaphragm. That acoustic delay causes this sound wave to be slightly out of phase from this sound wave, 
thus canceling out sound at the back of the microphone. Interestingly enough, a lot of certain types of vocalists, and I won't mention any specific genres in general, like to hold the microphone by doing this to the microphone because it looks really cool on stage. They cup it. And what happens when they cup the microphone is they block the entrance to this thing going in the back here, this entrance to this back port, and they close that off. And they basically take a very good directional microphone and make it into a really crummy sounding omnidirectional microphone. So I always tell people that microphones are like children. They have a head case and they have a handle. Like your kids, you hold your microphone by the hand, not by the head, and you'll be much better off. If you do have an act that wants to cup the microphone, if he kind of fake cups it, leaving some of this porting open to get the back sound waves, he's going to get, he's not going to lose the directionality of the microphone as much. But when I see the guy that really cups the microphone and he wonders why his PA system is feeding back, that's the reason why. So all microphones are born omnidirectional. When I do this uh, class live, I actually demonstrate this and I'll take a really nice directional microphone like my SM58 and I will make it sound like a really bad omni and feedback in the room. But you guys are spared that excruciation tonight. Typically, a directional microphone will have some sort of porting on the capsule, and an omnidirectional microphone will have no ports on the capsule. These two look identical. It's a KM-184 and a KM-183. You can tell the difference because the 184 has the ports, and that's the acoustic labyrinth. We represent this directionality in something called the polar pattern. Now, you have to understand that, again, we're representing a three-dimensional thing. Think of an omnidirectional microphone as a sphere. It's a ball uh, in a two-dimensional plane. And all the microphone manufacturers pretty much use the same graphical representation. It allows us to compare between models and types as far as how they pick up sound. This can vary at different frequencies, and one kilohertz is the most common measurement frequency they use to define the polar pattern. So here's our polar pattern example, starting at omnidirectional, the sphere, working our way through cardioid to supercardioid to hypercardioid to line gradient or shotgun. And then finally, there's an exception to the rule, and that's the bidirectional or figure of eight pattern. Now imagine this is a sphere. So my Omnidirectional microphone is a ball, picks up sound equally from all sides. I poke in the bottom of the ball without doing anything to it. And all of a sudden, I get this cardioid pattern or heart shape pattern. If I have somebody squeeze the ball while I'm poking in, something's got to give somewhere. And that's why the supercardioid and the hypercardioid have that little lobe that sticks out the back. And that lobe is sensitive to sound. Consequently, as I squeeze that ball even tighter to make it narrower, I get even more lobes that come out, which the line gradient or shotgun microphone shows. So let's take a look at these in practicality. But first, sorry, I don't know the order of the slides, multi-pattern microphones. These provide multiple switchable polar patterns in one microphone. Typically, a multi-pattern microphone uses two separate diaphragms or capsules mounted back-to-back. -back. The signals are then combined in different ways to achieve the mono output. If I apply no voltage on the rear diaphragm, I get a cardioid pattern. If I have an equal in-phase voltage, i.e. the same polarity, on both diaphragms, I'll get an omni-pattern. If I reverse the polarity, and put the rear diaphragm out of phase, I'll get the bi-directional or figure of eight pattern. Most multi-pattern microphones will use a simple switch that allows me to go from omni to cardioid to figure of eight. Some multi-pattern microphones actually use a rotary control to do that same functionality. I have a variable pattern choir microphone system made by a static that allows me to vary the polar pattern from omni down to a very tight hypercardioid pattern by rotating a knob on the front panel of a little control box. So I can remote control that. Multi-pattern microphones. 
now that we know that we have these polar patterns and we have these um, different um, angles, for lack of better terms, we can use these angles to our advantage. And as Bing Crosby said, everybody's got a little angle and we're going to use these angles. The first angle is known as the angle of acceptance, and it's the measurement of the optimum coverage angle in which that microphone picks up sound. Outside that acceptal, acceptance angle, the level and performance is going to drop off by design steeply. And that determines the microphone's polar pattern and physical design of the mic. Finally, I get to a point in that angle known as the null point or the null angle. And that is a point in a directional microphone where maximum sound rejection occurs. And that's in relation to the front or on axis position of the microphone. That null point is important in our application because it's key to minimizing acoustical feedback or minimizing the pickup of undesired sounds, whether I'm in a recording or a live situation. So let's talk about these angles. Cardioid microphone. Typical cardioid microphone's angle acceptance is about 131 degrees. It gives us our classic heart-shaped pattern. I've poked in the bottom of the ball. The null point on a cardioid microphone is 180 degrees off axis. It's ideal where the monitor speakers are right in front of me to control or minimize feedback. My SM58 is a classic cardioid microphone. The, the null point is directly behind the angle of acceptance or the backside of the mic. If I squeeze that ball down a little bit while poking in the back, something's got to give, and I get the hypercardioid pattern. Typically 105 degrees angle of acceptance, and there's now a small lobe coming off the rear of the microphone that is sensitive to sound. It's important to note in all of these, what is key to a good directional microphone is as you go from the angle of acceptance to the null point, you want that drop off to occur equally across all frequencies. A lot of inexpensive or poorly designed directional microphones, that doesn't happen at all frequencies. If it happens to be at one of the frequencies in the vocal range, for example, your microphone is going to be more susceptible to picking up feedback from stage monitor speakers. So having a directional microphone where the frequencies drop off equally as you go from the angle of acceptance down to the null point is critical in, in, in that microphone's performance. A supercardioid microphone, by the way, has 115 degree angle of acceptance and a slightly smaller rear lobe. And some manufacturers will use supercardioid as their descriptor as opposed to hypercardioid. As I squeeze that ball down even further, I get to the line gradient or shotgun microphone. And line gradient's angle of acceptance is about 30 degrees typical based on the length of the microphone and the length of what is known as the interference tube. The interference tube is the side part of that shotgun microphone where the little slots are that's the going into the back chamber. Um, the Null point on a line gradient microphone depends on where those rear lobes appear, which is why when I teach this class for film guys, I tell them don't use your shotgun microphone indoors because those lobes are going to pick up um, reflections off the ceiling. I used to, when I was doing this live, I did this class once and I was doing it for a bunch of broadcast and film guys, and I carried a whole assembly of assorted shotgun microphones with me on my flight. I ran through TSA and the guy says, what's in the bag, sir? I said, shotguns. And needless to say, I almost missed my flight, but it's another story. Um, the exception, oh, uh, somebody asked me about this at the last class. So here are some line gradient shotgun mics back in the day. The uh, EV644 sound spot, I have one of those in my collection, was designed for public address applications the 642 Cardaline, these are all dynamic shotgun microphones. Most shotgun mics today are condensers. Uh, the 642 Cardaline was used in film and some television applications. And the 643 EV Cardaline was a seven foot long shotgun microphone. It's probably most commonly known as the mic that was used to pick up press questions during John F. Kennedy's press conferences. 
you may have also seen this on sidelines of some sporting events. Uh, typically today, they're using parabolic mics that have an extremely narrow angle of acceptance uh, for picking up the quarterback, uh, calling the plays in a football game. Although NFL enhanced audio actually puts microphones in some of the uh, players and they turn those on to get some of that close up sound. So there's some shotguns from back in the day and you can see how big that thing is compared to that TV camera and the guy holding it. The exception to our polar pattern rule is the figure of eight or the bi-directional. <clears throat> And it's 130 degrees typical equally on the front and rear of the capsule. So unlike all the others where I'm looking at the side of the microphone, in the figure of eight capsule, I'm looking down at the top of that microphone. The null points are 90 degrees off axis, which makes a figure of eight microphone, such as an RCA 77 or 44, um, an ideal microphone for a talk show where the host and talent are on opposite sides of a table, the microphone's in the middle. By the way, the RCA 77B could be made into a cardioid microphone by moving a, a little switch in the back of the microphone that actually moved a metal deflector to block the sound hitting the back side of that ribbon. So it made it a cardioid mechanically, not electrically. Ribbon microphones, uh, by their design, have this pickup pattern, figure of eight. So let's take these angles and let's put them into some examples. And here's a live sound example. So I've got a lead vocalist. He's singing. I use an SM58 or a cardioid microphone, and I put the stage monitor, monitor wedge right in front of him. But now my singer wants to step a little bit further back from the microphone because he's playing some acoustic instrument, and he wants a little bit of room between him and the microphone. So I use a hypercardioid microphone with a little bit narrower angle of acceptance, which will allow me a little bit greater working distance. But because my null point is now 60 degrees off axis from the uh, microphone, I need to put two monitors in the 60 degree points as shown by this diagram. Now, every once in a while, you'll be seeing a guy at a concert and he's got three monitors in front of him. What's the one in the middle? That's the teleprompter because he's forgotten wor the words to most of his hit songs. In fact, Claire Brothers makes a uh, monitor speaker housing that holds a little 19-inch flat screen TV. It looks just like one of their wedges. So now we move on to the bane of most live sound guys' existence, and that is the background vocalists. Because we all know that in live sound gigs, especially at the club level, the significant other of the drummer has to be in the band. And we all know that the significant other of the drummer can't carry a tune in a pail. Is the worst singer like someone fingernails on a chalkboard or playing a live cat with a chainsaw? So here's how I solve that problem. So on the left, I have three background singers that know how to blend, that know how to work together. And I use a single cardioid microphone and a single monitor and they blend as an ensemble in the case of the right i've got that significant other of the drummer i make certain that their microphone is really blinged up well lots of sparkles on it so it stands out and i give them each their own microphones and i mix them accordingly that the significant other of the drummer is not necessarily in the front of house mix so the only two only people that are annoyed are the other two background singers so one way to solve that problem. So angles and stage monitors. Another application of using the angles with microphones is minimizing hi-hat bleed in a snare drum microphone. A lot of folks will use a cardioid microphone like an SM58. Uh, the difficulty is, is positioning to minimize hi-hat bleed on the snare mic. I've got to put it in a not opportune place for the drummer. I use a hypercardioid microphone, uh, Audio-Technica ATM650 or an ATM230, um, where I now can put the hi-hat in that 60-degree off-angle spot, and I minimize the pickup of the hi-hat in my snare drum microphone, and it's in a more convenient place for the drummer, so he's less likely to hit it or be in his way. So other examples of util utilizing those angles to our benefit. If I'm doing some film situation, if I have a loud talker and a soft talker, by putting the loud talker slightly 
more off axis on the microphone, I can blend between the two with a single microphone. So utilizing these angles can help us out in a lot of different ways. Now the inverse square law. So because we have the inverse square, we like make the inverse square the factor of two or doubles. Sound is reduced by a factor of four square two. This results in drop of sixty dB and sound pressure levels reduce decrease. And when that just got in half five two, the sound is reduced by six dB. So what does that mean? That basically means the closer you are, the louder you get. So if I've got a if I've got a a talent, and I have them. They, they move from one inch to two inch away from their vocal microphone, I'm going to get about a six dB drop. Moving from two inches to four inches away, I'll give me another six dB drop. From four to eight inches away, I'll get a third six dB drop, which means from moving from one inch away to eight inches away, I lose about 16 dB or about 18 dB of, of level. So what do I do? I move the microphone closer to the sound source. It's that simple, the inverse square law. The closer you are, the louder you're going to get. Working distance. A lot of film guys will say that microphones have reach. What's the reach on that shotgun microphones? Well, microphones don't have reach. They can't reach out and grab a sound. I tell the class, if I could invent a microphone that could reach out and grab sound from 20 feet away, I wouldn't be here today because I would be on a beach in Acapulco with a drink with an umbrella in my hand, feeling the waves lapping up on my feet. But microphones do have something known as the working distance. And the working distance is based on two things, the environment I'm in and the pickup pattern of the microphone. As the pickup pattern becomes more directional, it's going to reduce the pickup or reject unwanted sound from the off-axis directions, from the sides and the rear. The environment comes into play because if I'm out in the middle of the Mojave Desert on a clear, cloudless, lovely night, I can be quite a ways from my sound source because there's not a whole lot of environmental noise, signal to noise ratio. However, if I'm on, if I'm in the Pike Place market and they're throwing fish like crazy and the crowd's going wild, and I'm trying to interview somebody about why they throw fish at the Pike Place market, he better be pretty close to his microphone because the signal to noise ratio, the environment, is going to make it difficult to pick him up or for that microphone to hear him over all of the noise. Now, can I, again, I can use a more directional microphone because it's going to minimize the pickup of that off-axis sound. But if that, as I tell the film folks, even if I use a very directional microphone, if the talent is three feet away from me when I'm interviewing him, he's going to sound like he's three feet away. I can't bring him closer unless I physically move the microphone closer to the talent or to the subject. So microphones don't have reach, but they do have working distance. This is a terminology. This is Steve terms. And again, this is one of these things where somebody tried to use the word proximity, but it's not the same as proximity. Could people get confused with proximity effect? And I call this a transparent style microphone versus an adjacent style microphone. And what do I mean by transparent versus adjacent? Basically, in a transparent style microphone, the volume change versus the working distance is gradual as you move away from the sound source or the talent. So as I move the microphone away, the level is going to drop off gradually. The result is a more natural and less forced sound. I can also deploy my microphone at greater distances. However, it's more the microphone, a, a transparent style microphone is more sensitive to sound in general, and it can pick up more background sound. An adjacent style microphone means the volume change versus the working distance is more pronounced. It drops off quickly. The SM58 is a classic <clears throat> adjacent style microphone. You need to work this microphone fairly close. As soon as I move away more than a couple inches, the level drops off very rapidly. An adjacent style microphone, because it's worked up close, emphasizes the, vo the voice in kind of a tight close-up way. And it works best when kept close to the sound source. It's also less sensitive to sounds in general, which means it's going to naturally reject more background noise, which is why a 
a Jason style microphone on a live stage on a vocalist is going to pick up less of the drummer behind him than if I used a transparent style microphone in that same situation. Most condenser microphones by design are transparent style microphones. Most dynamic microphones by design are adjacent style microphones. I always like the, the band that goes out and they go to the big box music emporium and they get one of these great microphone deals where you buy four and you get six free. I think they come in different colors and I'll see them put two of these low cost dynamic adjacent style microphones about two feet above the cymbals, trying to use them as drum overhead mics. And they wonder why they're not really picking much up. So transparent style microphones, the volume change is gradual as you move away from the microphone. The level drops off slowly. An adjacent style microphone, as you move away from the microphone, the level drops off rapidly. Those are two Steve terms, which I'd like to see more people in the industry use because it really can help in choosing the right microphone for the right application, knowing how they perform that way. Let's talk about polarity and phase. I see these things all the time called phase reversals. And phase is the wave relationship over time. Polarity is the electrical connections. So if I reverse most microphone, I say most, most microphone manufacturers say that a positive pressure on the diaphragm results in a positive voltage on pin two of that three conductor microphone output cable. And a positive pressure results in a negative voltage on pin three of that three conductor microphone output cable. They make these little things called phase reversals. And what they do is they reverse the polarity of that pin two and three of that connector. You can buy them in the store or you can make them yourself. And what that does is that now says a positive pressure on the diaphragm causes a negative voltage on pin two and the positive voltage on pin three. Where is that useful? It basically puts the audio 180 degrees out of phase on the second microphone if I'm using two microphones together. The classic example is snare top and snare bottom. I reverse the polarity on the snare bottom mic, so now the two diaphragms, like two speakers being in phase, work together in a push-pull arrangement. One of the big issues that happens is a film person will take a mono microphone, SM58, take its three-pin microphone connection and connect it to a three pin eighth inch mini plug and plug it into the stereo input on their camcorder. And what they've basically done is they put the output signal on the tip of that connector is positive when the diaphragm goes forward and negative when the diaphragm goes forward on the ring. They're sitting in their edit bay editing a away and it all sounds fine on their stereo speakers in their editing bay until they hit the mono button or send it to somebody that's going to watch their little video on a mono TV in grandma's house. And all of a sudden their dialogue disappears. And that's because of this polarity and phase relationship on that eighth inch connector. So polarity and phase. Polarity is electrical connections and phase is wave relationships. Sound pressure level or SPL. And there's a maximum SPL rating in microphones. And it's the loudest sound be before distortion. It's expressed in decibels. And all the manufacturers use the same rating. Obviously, the larger, the bigger the value, the better. And dynamic microphones, by their design, their motors, will typically handle a much higher SPL, louder sounds, than other types of microphones. As I said earlier, in a condenser microphone, it is often the electronics that are going to overload on loud sounds and not the diaphragm. Although in some situations, the diaphragm's bottomed out um, on an extremely loud, loud sound. Sound pressure level, max SPL in microphones. The high pass or low cut filter. A lot of condenser microphones will have a low cut filter that will roll off the low frequency response of the microphone at about 80 Hertz. I typically will engage that low cut filter on everything that is not being used for a specific low frequency source, i.e. a kick drum, a bass guitar. 
It's going to make your vocals pop out in your mix. It's also going to help minimize the pickup of mechanical noise, mic stands, noise coming up the cable. Believe it or not, a lot of mechanical noise can come up this microphone cable. And simply wrapping the cable around the microphone stand, or if you're hand holding the microphone, putting a loop in the cable will make some of that noise go away. Um, if you don't have a low cut switch on your microphone and your condenser mic, uh, you can use the low frequency control on the console or input if you're doing live things uh, or a high pass switch on uh, your console. There is one microphone that Audio Technica makes. It's a guitar amp microphone that actually has a low pass filter or a high cut filter. It's designed to roll off the high frequencies after about 8K to help minimize the pickup of the uh, buzz on a guitar amp. And I thought that was a pretty cool piece. I don't, I don't know if it's still available or not. So with that, let's talk about making the connections. Unbalanced audio. A typical guitar cable. A two-pin quarter-inch connector tip sleeve. Signal travels in one direction down the cable. The tip is the positive voltage. The shield or ground connects to the, the sleeve, and that's a return path. Noise is in noise induced across that line. Um, there's a typo on this thing. Uh, can cause hum because it's being picked up. It's being induced. But it's a common connection for musical instruments, consumer audio equipment, and some low-cost home recording microphones from the 60s and 70s. Microphones utilize a balanced line topology. It was originally designed by the telephone company. In our case, signal travels in both directions. Positive pressure puts a positive voltage on that pin 2 line and a negative voltage on pin 3. Signals are reversed in polarity, positive on pin two, negative on pin three. The shield or ground in this case does not connect to the connector shell, just to the pin one on the connector. Any noise that's induced across that line is going to cancel out because it's going positive on the pin two, negative on the pin three. It'll cancel any noise out. So if I lay a coil of AC power line across that guitar cable, it's going to hum like crazy. If I lay a coil of AC power line across my mic line, I'm not going to hear a thing. So microphones use a three-pin connector, which we lovingly call the XLR. Anybody out there know what XLR means? And I'll open the questions up. Anybody know what XLR means? Anybody want to take a, take a shot at it? I don't see the chat lighting up. Well, XLR, this is great. This is great stuff to know because you know you're you're walking down the street at the Pike Place Market and a man hops out of a fast speedboat and says, Hey, what's XLR mean? Now you're gonna be able to tell them. So X stands for the X series connector made by the ITT Canon Company, C-A-N-N-O-N, -N -N, no relation whatsoever to the folks that make fine cameras and lenses. L stands for lock or latching, and R stands for rubber or resilient, because the original XLR connectors had a resilient rubber insert in the female connector that allowed the pins to float a little bit. So if the male pins were a little out of alignment, they'd still make good contact. XLR has become a common term. Um, connectors are made by Switchcraft, Neutrik, Amphenol, and of course, ITT Canon still makes them. We also may see TRS phone plugs, which are tip ring sleeve, tip being the pin two, ring being the pin three, sleeve being the ground or pin one. Um, I went back and a little history of connectors. These are some early audio connectors. The Canon O series, if you have any of these lying around, and I actually have one, these are worth some money. Um, was one of the original microphone connectors. Some of the old RCA mics used it. The Canon P series, which is this big guy, was a broadcast standard in the 40s and 50s and into the early 60s. Electro Voice early broadcast mics used this UA series, which was smaller than the P series. And then eventually we all kind of jumped onto the Canon series and the original XL 
um, was uh, the X-Series connector with the lock or latch, but didn't have the rubber resilience insert. And that was originally used as a motor connector um, for film cameras. And then the original Canon XLRs had um, three little screws to put them together. One little screw held the uh, insert in and the two, two other little screws held the strain relief uh, in on the back or the strain relief on the cable in the back. A little XLR trivia, if you took that little strain relief off and flipped it around 180 degrees, you could handle a larger mic cable in that connector. And of course, there's always the connectors that we all loathe in the audio industry and that's the infamous Amphenol, Amphenol MC4Ms and MC3Ms with the little grippy metal thing that went under the back cap to grab the cable as part of the strain relief and of course that little PC was either lost or bent or broken and never had strain relief. The Amphenol MC4M allowed the user to change the microphone's output from high impedance to low impedance by which Penny connected to. The MC3M was a classic used on early Shure 55Ss and other uh, industrial type microphones. And last but not least, the infamous Switchcraft button microphone connector, which we used on high impedance paging microphones back in the day. The cool thing about that connector is you could unscrew that ring and let it slide down on the cable and you could make uh, a male or female end, depending on whether you unscrewed the ring and let it slide off. So a little microphone connector trivia. Uh, there's a fun article out on this. Uh, I've seen it on several AES uh, posts and uh, talks about even greater history in these dumb connectors. But luckily for us, we've all standardized on the XLR and the Switchcraft version was the QG and it was just sleeker looking than some of the other ones in design. We also have stereo microphones, which I'll talk about in a minute. And they use a five pin connector that allows us to get two audio signals, two balanced line audios, plus a common uh, ground on that connector. And that can, that fans out to two XLRs and most stereo microphones use that uh, configuration. Some of the uh, uh, tube mics that use XLR style connectors will use a six pin connector for the tube voltages and the audio signal. And there's some others uh, wiring anything beyond a four pin XLRs are kind of difficult to do, so I don't like them. So now phantom power. We talked about we could power our condenser microphones by sending a voltage up the microphone line, and that's known as phantom power. It was uh, developed by Neumann back in the day. It uh, Originally, there was a thing called T-power that was used to power condenser microphones, and that evolved into phantom power. So phantom power is anywhere from 9 to 52 volts DC with 48 volts being the most common. And that is uh, applied across the same mic cable as the audio signal. And they do it by putting the positive voltage on both the pin two and pin three connector conductors. And the return path for that DC voltage is the shield or pin one of the mic cable. Sources for phantom power could be a, uh, within the mixer or the mic pre. Uh, my little Focusrite mic pre has got a, a little button that turns on 48 volt phantom power for my um, condenser microphones. Um, it may be an external power supply. There's several companies that make external phantom power supplies. Um, there's an issue. There was an issue early on with uh, mixing consoles when live sound started going to uh, using more and more condenser microphones that needed the true 48 volts of phantom power. There was an AES paper written uh, 15 years ago on uh, loading the phantom power rails of a live sound console by putting too many condenser microphones uh, on it. Uh, in my symphony hall, my recording booth is about 500 feet from where my uh, mic hang is on the stage by the by the way it goes around and about the building and i ended up was running into issues with poor performance on my uh, my my recording mics because they all required a full 48 volts of phantom and i was losing voltage through the old building wiring so we ended up putting a remote phantom power supply you know, closer to where the mic hang is 
and eliminated that problem. So external power supplies, mixer preamp interface. Some condenser microphones, primarily electrets, can be operated on a battery, <clears throat> but that's not true phantom power. That's providing a bias voltage uh, and, and for the electronics, but it doesn't necessarily uh, bias the backplane. I use battery-operated condenser microphones in broadcast applications where I run into the situation where the outside plant in a stadium, uh, the wiring has gotten old and usually the shields are the first to go. So the shields aren't making good connections someplace. Signal lines are, shields get corroded. And so we'd lose the phantom voltage. So we put battery operated condenser microphones to pick up the visitor's side crowd noise. So battery operated condenser mics are still commonly used. Now the question is, is what happens if I put a dynamic micro, I plug a dynamic microphone into this circuit with 48 volts on it? And the answer is nothing. And that question is on my final. If you leave it blank, you'll get it right. So it doesn't affect the dynamic microphones. Why? Because the dynamic microphones uh, coil is only connected to pins two and three of the signal line, right? It's my audio signal. The shield or pin one is not made, is not connected to anything within the microphone. It's just a shield. No connections made to that ground point. However, Phantom power can destroy some vintage ribbon microphones. And the reason why is the early RCA 44s and some of the early 77s in that series used a center tap transformer for their output transformer. And the center tap of that transformer was tied to ground or pin one on the cable. So if I plug this microphone into a circuit with phantom power, I complete the circuit between both sides of that transformer and the center tap to ground. And now my ribbon operates just like a fuse and goes poof in a second. So use caution in connecting vintage ribbon microphones. I know a lot of guys have gone in and modded their mics and eliminated the center tap to ground. Uh, so they can use it if they've got phantom power in the studio. I just don't turn phantom power on when I bring out my 44 Bs. So phantom power. Is this, you, by the way, I was uh, in Los Angeles down do by the Staples Center. Yes. Um, Luke Pacholsky asks, how can the ribbon blow like a fuse when the transformer doesn't pass DC? It's being induced into the coil on the primary side and it induces into the coil on the secondary side and you get a current flow. Yeah, but it would, it would only be a momentary spike. It wouldn't be a continuous. That's spike. all it takes. <laughs> it goes poof like a fuse. Remember that ribbon is finer than a human hair. Believe me, I've seen it happen. Not on my microphones, but I've seen it happen. So yeah, well that it's the it's the initial surge rush that comes in that causes an it, it it induces across the secondary, and you get this big spike, and that big spike is just enough to to make it go. So I was in uh, L.A. at AES a few years back, and this guy was selling this on the street called the Smoking Hot Microphone Power Adapter. Makes cheap microphones sound really expensive, and expensive microphones sound really hot. I usually give this to the guy in the band that thinks he knows everything and wants to help with sound. So you go plug your mic into this, see what happens. Anyway, it's my bad joke of the night. My little friend over there said my expensive mic worked really great right before I plugged it in. It's only $9.99, 22 bucks west of the Mississippi. Order yours online today. So there you go. So I'll move into some more exotic microphones and then I'll kind of wrap it because it's uh, been almost two hours here. So I just want to watch my time. So stereo microphones. Two condenser microphones with individual outputs housed in a single housing. And the element determines the, the element configuration determines the, the type of stereo that's going to be. Um, typically, you'll see them arranged like the top two. The capsules are in a traditional XY pattern to provide my left and right stereo. However, the one on the bottom, that's an Audio-Technica uh, 4050 ST, because it's a multi-pattern microphone using uh, 
two capsules. We can use mid-side. It's got a mid-side decoder built into it, or I can use an external decoder. And the outputs are fed through this mid-side matrix decoder. And if I use an external decoder, I can vary the ratio between the mid capsule and the side capsule, which allows me to increase or decrease the width of my stereo field remotely. Now the microphone has a built-in, you can flip a little switch on the back that says MS, which will give me my mid and side output, or it's got a built-in decoder that'll give me 120 degrees or 90 degrees by how I flip the switch. And the little box on the right is a, is a portable decoder, mid-side decoder made by radial. Uh, I use this microphone a lot of times as a room mic, and I have the opportunity to either um, uh, mid-side decode it in post, or oftentimes I'll just preset one of the two mid-side, or one of the two uh, uh, de preset decode positions, 90 or 125 degrees, and use it as a stereo mic that way to give me a left and right output. So pretty, pretty cool example. There's also some stereo microphones that have the mid-side configuration to give you the, the mid-side and uh, uh, to vary the stereo width in post-production. Binaural microphones. A lot of folks are getting into binaural recording. Uh, it's a 3D recording technique to simulate what a person hears if they were sitting in the concert. It's based on how we hear. <clears throat> So the ears in this case, in both the KU-100 and the 3DO binaural rig, are set in the ear canals of those artificial uh, earlobes. And the in the case of the KU-100, you've got a head-shaped device. It's got some resonance ca resonant cavities in it to simulate the shape of the human head. The 3DO is just giving you the spacing uh, of, a, of a human, a small human head to give your, um, using with that shape and the ears to perceive your directionality. The best effect for this binaural microphone technique is being done through headphones. You can also take uh, small microphones and wear them like in-ear earphones in the ear canals. And now your head becomes part of the microphone. Um, and, um, uh, or microphones incorporated into this human head uh, fixture where the little rubber ears work like your ears, or you can put, or you can do these little uh, uh, microphones in your ears as well. Uh, I have not done much with binaural recording, so I can't uh, I can't say much on it. But it's kind of an interesting interesting concept. I've seen some people walk into concerts wearing these earphones because they're doing their tapers. I, I did hear if the person turns their head or scratches their ears while they're recording, you're going to pick up that and the, the, the direction will change as they turn their head doing that. Surround sound microphones. These are single microphones that are designed to capture multi-channel surround sound and the holophone H2 and H3 are probably the ones that most people think about. Um, these are used in broadcast and some live event recording and they give you a single point to capture a 5-1 or a 7-1 type surround scenario on a single point microphone. These guys will work with uh, an eight channel or in the case of the H3, a six channel preamp. And then you can take those, uh, you know, the left center, right, left surround, right surround and so on and LFE and output those into your surround mix and then pan appropriately in your surround mix. But it's a dedicated surround sound microphone. That leads me into the next one, which is ambisonic. And I just started to study this a little bit. So if there's anyone that this could be a whole topic for an AES meeting just on ambisonics, just from what I've learned and in, in, in discovering this a little bit. And I'm really interested in getting more involved in doing some ambisonic recording. So now we take our MS stereo, where I can widen and narrow the stereo field. And now I want to capture a three-dimensional 360-degree audio. So I add to my traditional MS difference channels for height and depth, depth being front to back. Unlike the surround sound microphones, where in order to get the effect, I've got to have the appropriate surround sound 7.1 or 5.1 speaker system for playback. The ambisonic is not tied to any specific speaker configuration. It can be decoded to any type of speaker array in post-production. 
the most widely used ambisonic um format today is first order or four channel b format and i'm going to put the little announcement out we have a big thunderstorm i just heard thunder clap in the background so if i lose power and internet um it was nice knowing you so i shouldn't because i'm on battery backup on most of the gear here but i might lose my connection i just heard some big clap of thunder um, the four channels in this ambisonic represent different polar patterns pointing in a specific direction. And that's what the little diagram shows. So the first uh, is the W, and that is an omnidirectional polar pattern that picks up all the sounds in the sphere coming from all directions at equal gain and phase. Then I have a series of bidirectional patterns, one pointing forward, one pointing left, and one pointing up. That's the X and the, the X, the Y, and the Z. That is a first order ambisonic uh, format. Uh, it's called a B format because the B format is how it is reproduced in post production. The microphone actually records in something called an A format, and then that is decoded using software plugins. I'll get to that in the next slide in post-production, allowing you to do some really creative things with an ambisonic microphone in post that would normally take you moving microphones around at the actual live session. Now, higher order B formats consist of more channels or more microphones, and they can provide higher spatial resolutions. And where this comes into play is in virtual reality, where you're seeing the uh, people in the metaverse wearing the headsets and gaming wearing the headsets, where you want to now become one within that reality. So what we're seeing in this little diagram is the, the sphere and the first row of uh, little bidirectional globes is my first order B format. Add the next row, which is the one, two, three, four, five rows of little globes. That becomes my second order, which now requires more microphone elements. Finally, you take and you add the bottom row, and that becomes my third order. You can go up to sixth order ambisonics B format. 49 channels to accomplish that. And that can be done using multiple ambisonic microphones. You can do up to third, um, second order, if I'm correct, using a single ambisonic microphone. So let's take a look at ambisonic microphones. The first order ambisonic microphone is often called a tetrahedral microphone. There's four capsules on a single handle. The capsules are typically small diaphragm condensers, although there is one company that makes a large diaphragm condenser tetrahedral microphone. They're all cardioid patterns, and they output to four analog XLR outputs. And this, uh, along with its ambisonic um, uses for virtual surround, can also model spatially co coincident microphone techniques using a single microphone. As you move into higher order ambisonic microphones, the second order microphone has eight capsules, which is the core octo mic or the Voyage VASAM1D. Those are eight capsule microphones. I put a third order, which is the Elgin mic EM32. That has 32 capsules in that sphere. In this case, the outputs can be analog XLR, Dante, USB, or Firewire, depending on the microphone manufacturer. As I add more capsules, I allow greater resolution in my 360 degree space. And these higher order ambisonic microphones can now also model spaced microphone arrays like our traditional decatry, RTF, or double mid side arrangements and so on and so forth. So it's pretty fascinating stuff, but I wanted to just talk about these a little bit because I think they're really fascinating with virtual reality, 360 degree video coming into play, more stuff happening with the gamers and that I could see more and more um, applications for ambisonic and virtual reality microphones. And I literally was just getting into this in the last week or so. So I'm not, I, I don't have a whole lot of background on it. And I am open to anybody that would want to add 
um, and any other input on this. I could see ambisonic recording techniques as a whole um, uh, presentation that I would love to come and see. So recording with an ambisonic mic. So I record with my ambisonic mic. I place the microphone. And how I place the microphone affects what I get because how I position the microphone, if I put it vertically, it's going to do one thing. If I turn it right, left, forward, or backwards, it's going to do another thing on how I capture my my uh, my different my sound coming from different sources. It records as four discrete mono channels. And they are transformed into the B format using these DAW ambisonic plugins. And I put the Rode Soundfield plugin that works with their mic and then the Waves ambisonic plugin. So by taking these B format components, the W, X, Y, and Z channels, using one of these decoder or plugins, I can now start to create coincident pairs. I can start to position where sounds are coming from within the sound field in post-production. Where in the past, if I wanted to emulate where a sound was coming from behind me, I may have to do something at, on location. So this manipulation allows me to pick out desired sounds and suppress unwanted sounds in post-production and balance between direct and reverberant sound that can be fine-tuned during mixing in post-production, all using a single microphone. Uh, so it's really, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And I, I really want to learn more about it. Um, so I just started to jump into this a little bit. I don't own an ambisonic microphone. I would love to get one to play with and try some of this stuff, especially, I'd love to put one of these in the middle of the symphony orchestra and, uh, and, and, and do some ambisonic recording along with the regular stuff I do. So it's really kind of fun, fascinating stuff. So with that, I'm done talking about microphones, but I'm going to wrap up with some microphone techniques for the really tough stuff. And this is based on many years of audio experience and all around common expense. I'm going to give you some insider secrets and techniques on how to mic some of the more challenging sound sources out there. By the way, that is not my studio console, uh, but that is my trademark look. So um, here we go. So how do you mic a banjo? You don't. How do you mic the accordion? You don't. How do you mic the bagpipes? Nah. So, you know, I collect these funny photos when I do this presentation. I buy these off of these... Um, online uh, stock photo places and i found this one it was called girl with microphone i paid a dollar for this photo for the rights to use it what is wrong with this picture that is a vacuum tube studio side address condenser microphone that she is holding in her hand and there is no cable coming out the bottom and she's singing into the top of it but she is really happy so a lot of guys say to me, how many microphones do you put on a podium or a lectern for a talker? And oftentimes you'll see two microphones because they think if the talker leans left, he'll be picked up by one mic. The talker leans right, he'll be picked up by the second. When I do this live, I actually do this demonstration. The problem with that is because those microphones are slightly different from the sound source, if he's right dead center and at the right distance, those two microphones will cause phase cancellation will occur and the, the level will drop considerably. So I run into that situation. I rubber band the two capsules together, the two microphones together. But this is the other reason why you don't put two microphones on a podium. And then I was doing a gig once and I had a young intern. He worked for the big box music store. And I said, Felix, can you mic the Marshall lamp for me? He said, okay. I don't think that's going to work. And then this is not how you mic a saxophone. And how in the world do you mic that drum set? By the way, that's Terry Bozio's kit at the DW facility in Oxnard, California. I did some uh, microphone drum miking videos at that facility once. And uh, I actually got to sit. I'm a drummer. I got to sit behind it. I had no idea what to hit first. 
So with the, oh, the, this was brought up because somebody asked me this during rehearsal. And a lot of guys are dealing with lavalier microphones, either on talkers or in church or in a broadcast situation. And remember we talked about sound driving up the microphone cable and why you wrap microphone cables around mic stands. This is called the broadcast or newsman's loop for a lav mic. Pretend the little piece of cardboard is the person's clothing. By making this little loop in the cable, I eliminate noise, mechanical noise coming up the cable and eliminate a lot of the mechanical noise on the microphone. So the cable loops out, it goes between the clip and the cardboard in the back and it's held in place rather than just letting the cable hang down in the front. One, it looks nicer because you can dress the cable under the person's clothing. And two, it holds the cable tightly in place and it minimizes <clears throat> it minimizes the uh, mechanical noise pickup. So that's a, a little takeaway that it's a really cool trick to know. I do a lot more on broadcast miking techniques for film and video in this. And I do a thing on live streaming with microphones as well as another version of this class. But this is the physics of microphones, application and techniques for studio live sound. <laughs> when I do this master class version, there's a second half that talks about how to mic a bunch of things because of our time constraints. It's, it's 11 o'clock my time. Um, I've gone two hours straight. Um, I've actually gone longer on this class because people are interested and I'm more than happy to stay up as long as you guys want because I'm having a blast uh, unless the thunderstorm does its number on my internet uh, you can reach me at ssavanu at bufordthedgehog.com and it looks like bufordthejog.com because of my name um, my phone number is also on there feel free to call me I love talking microphones and trying to answer questions as much as I can with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and um, you now can see my smiling face and uh, I'll uh, uh, open uh, open for questions or however you want to take, I'll let you guys, uh, Greg, I'll let you drive it from here. I'm going to sure. take a I, my I'll water. try to help moderate some things and just a couple questions that came up in the chat that are uh, came up earlier. And then I think that it might be um, it might be easier in a, in certain cases if people want to to um, you know open up your mic and ask Steve a question or how, if you have a comment um, we might might be easier to do it that way. But I did want to touch upon a question that Dan Mortensen put in the chat, um, asking a little bit more info about your terminology, uh, Steve, about the transparent versus adjacent classifications. Okay. Um, he he asks. How does the, I'm sorry, how does the transparent versus adjacent classification conform to the inverse square law or violate it? Well, the inverse square law is going to say as, as the distance, um, as you double the distance, that's the square, of, it's the square. The, the catch to it is the, the, the SM58 is an adjacent mic. I need to be close to it. And as I start to move away, just because of the nature of it being a dynamic microphone with a motor assembly, it's going to drop off quickly. Okay. The condenser microphone, it's still inverse square law that's happening. The level's still dropping off based on the inverse square law, but it drops off gradually over the distance rather than a, an abrupt drop off. So the adjacent mic kind of breaks the inverse square law a little bit because it you're you're moving it just a slight amount before that level drops off really quick. Is that are you saying Ant? that are you saying that those two different kinds of microphones one dissipates the audio energy and heat because it's a motor and the other one doesn't? So there's less energy getting into the well, it, it takes more energy to move that diaphragm and coil of wire. Yes. than it does just to move a diaphragm that's suspended in front of a pl a backplate. So it takes it takes a lot more energy to do that. And because that diaphragm is mounted to that coil of wire and it's floating over that magnet, you hit it with a transient uh, smack that's going to push that diaphragm forward. And then the, then the spring action of the edge of the diaphragm 
that's holding it in place is going to want to pull that uh, coil of wire back. The magnet's going to want to pull it back and forth a little bit, and it's going to give you that that motion. Uh, that that's the motor motion where the the condenser microphone you've got a diaphragm there's no there's no mechanical structure attached to the diaphragm in a condenser or a ribbon microphone the diaphragm itself is attached to the insulating spacer but it's not attached to any mechanical mechanism i.e like the uh uh, the, the dynamic is like a loudspeaker, so it's attached to that physical coil of wire wrapped on that paper core. All that has mass, and that then it's floating in that magnet. So that's why the condenser mics are so sensitive to all the little detail-y stuff, because it doesn't take much energy to move those. Steve, it strikes, me, it strikes me that your definitions in many ways are perhaps based a lot on sort of practical experience, and that in... In your terminology, in a way, you're bringing to the table a more of a practical uh, yes. discussion that um, maybe um, doesn't get into necessarily talking about the general generalities of these microphones. Like, for example, an, a transparent mic is not just simply a condenser microphone or a high sensitivity mic, and an adjacent mic is not just simply a dynamic mic or a low sensitivity mic, but rather your own kind of definition of how you put these, these things into practice. As right? I said, these were those were Steve terms based on field experience and utilizing these things day in and day out. And primarily, you know, trying to come up with ways to define these, which are fairly technical topics in ways that maybe a, a non-technical performer um can understand how they work that's the whole idea behind the physics and behind it it's all physics luke did you have a comment i was just going to say i i think i was a bit confused because you're portraying it as being distance related but it's really just level related right well no it is distance related because as i move in a transparent style microphone as I move away from the microphone, the level drops off in a gradual sort of way. Where, but I mean, but a, a certain level at a point in space. I'll put it this way: a certain level hitting the microphone capsule is a certain level, regardless of distance. If well, there's an, if there's an SPL an inch from the microphone of whatever. Mm -hmm. And that same SPL is coming from 50 feet away, but it's still hitting the microphone. That's still the same SPL. It's but but now the distance comes into play. That's your inverse square law. But that's that's already been taken into account because I'm, I'm talking about the SPL at the microphone. Right, but the SPL the the SPL at the microphone. If it's if it's if it's a certain level at the microphone, as you move away. Just, just as if I'm talking, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm humming at a certain level, and you're standing in front of me, and you back away, you walk away, the level because the distance inverse square is going to decrease as you're what you're hearing, what you're perceiving. Same thing right. here. Right, but I'm saying if you're if you're at a, a particular point in space and something an inch away from you is the same SPL as something five feet away, five feet away from you. That level is the same at your ear, regardless of what the distance is. The distance of the, the further element is louder at the source, but inverse square says it gets quieter by the time it gets to you. But if the SPL of the two of those is, is at the same at your position in space, it doesn't matter what the microphone is, it's still the same SPL. Still the same SPL. What I'm saying is the 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 the, the what the level. I don't know. Maybe level is not the right term. The perceived amount of sound at the microphone as you move the microphone away. If if I'm if I'm recording using a transparent microphone and I back it away from I'm going la and I back that microphone away. 
you will hear a gradual decline without touching any controls on the recording device. You'll hear a gradual decline in level in a quiet room. You'll hear a gradual decline in level as I move that microphone away until it disappears. If I'm using an adjacent style microphone, as I move the microphone away, that level will drop that on what I'm seeing on the recorder will drop off quickly as I move it away. That's what I'm getting at. But, and trying that, to, but, but that, but that's suggesting then that if that's, if you have the same SPL, well, like, okay. So if you, you know, you're basically saying, okay, the SPL at an inch is very high and at 30 feet, it's very low. And that makes total sense. Yep. But if you, measure the SPL at 30 feet, that SPL is hitting a condenser mic and that same SPL is hitting a dynamic mic. So you're saying for the same SPL, the dynamic mic is quieter because it's a dynamic? It takes more energy to move that diaphragm on the dynamic mic. It's less sensitive to that energy hitting it. So right, but, it, but it's- Try, it, but try it, try it, try it with a pair of mics. Take isn't a- the sensitivity I mean, you're saying it's not linear with SPL. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, I'm just, I, I guess I'm just trying to define this to, to help people in choosing a microphone. So what I'm saying is with a transparent style mic, as I back away from the mic, my level to my recording device or my sound system is going to drop off gradually. As I with a adjacent style mic, as I back away from the mic, it's going to drop. It's going to drop off quickly, as to what I'm picking up. Yeah, um, I think we should probably keep kind of moving on. Yeah, but I, do, yeah I mean, I, do I think mean, a way I don't know how to. I don't know how to define it in scientific terms. I guess is yeah. what you and, might be and asking. I think that what but, what I was talking about earlier. It that, works that this that these labels that you're giving things, Steve, that they're based upon practical experience. Yeah, everything and it's not everything, necessarily. This, a scientific, um, it's not, it's not necessarily a scientific that. theory because a lot of situations that we're in today, how do you explain some of the scientific theory to someone that doesn't understand the scientific theory? I'm using practical examples. I think a good that. way of addressing sort of uh, a good question for you, Steve, would be like, could you maybe give our audience some examples of some dynamic mics or ribbon microphones that might that you might put into the family of transparent or do they not exist? I, I think a dynamic microphone just by the nature of its design is probably going to, uh, which is why a dynamic microphone is less susceptible to picking up background noise. You're in a live sound situation and you've got a vocalist screaming into a, you know, singing into a dynamic microphone and you've got the drummer behind him. Even though the drummer's on axis, because of the the design of the microphone, it's less it's less sensitive to picking that stuff up. And I mean, I maybe I should dig into the theory more on it um, as I go forward with the presentations. But in in reality, it's practical. It's it's a practical example, is what I'm trying to say. It's really trying to explain it so that the guy that's going out by it's really designed for the film students that are trying to figure out why um how to get their um their lav mics to intercut better with their boom sound is really where they where it came from that's where we discovered it the first time so okay. but um, it's, it's we, a very practical example i use it all the time in explaining it to people okay let's keep going okay. um uh dan mortensen also had a question about like if anybody in the audience with live sound experience had any um and this sounded like a kind of nightmare scenario, but uh, an artist that wants their monitors really loud, but is also cupping their vocal microphones. Is there anything we can do as engineers in that situation when the artist is asking us for more in their monitor when they're cupping the mic like that? Well, you could notch, you could notch some of the offending frequencies away, but the issue is when they cup that microphone and they block those ports, the microphone, you've lost all of the benefits of the directionality of that microphone because they've basically just made it into an Omni. 
uh, and and a poor frequency response omni at that. Um, the best thing to do is teach them how to cup the microphone, which is like this. So you leave part of it exposed. So now when I'm singing, it still looks like I'm cupping the mic. But a lot of these performers, they just think they got to do this and they just grab it because they think it's some of them think it's going to make them louder. And it really doesn't. It just it just becomes a, you know, you can EQ the monitors a little bit, but then you start to really take away everything else to, to, to tame the feedback. Okay. And that's a fine answer theoretically, but the reality is that there are people in that situation every night of the week all yes. over the world who are doing something. And I'd like to know what they're doing to make it work. But no, nobody here obviously is like that. So well, what what I've done is taught them how to hold the mic so it looks like they're cupping the mic, but they're not really cupping the mic. And EQ them, EQ the monitors as necessary to knock some of the mid-range out. Here's another interesting question. Uh, Sound Suresh asks, um, why are we using a single capsule or diaphragm to pick up all the freq frequencies? In speaker reproduction, we often have two or three-way systems to reproduce frequencies. Why are we not applying the same kind of approach to microphone design? I would, I'd have to say, one, the complexity of doing that. Um, and two, the, the 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 speakers. You know, I'm, I'm going to say maybe the power that you have to put into the loudspeakers. So, in other words, your the the mechanics of that large woofer are not going to allow you to reproduce the the really top end high frequencies. And so you put the tweeter in, and now you've got to put you know, the crossover and, and and so on and so on. I think it just becomes the mechanics becomes too complex to put into something that we're trying to make as small as possible to hold into your hand. I do know there are um, in-ear monitor earpieces that use um, multi-armatures to do high, you know, mid-range, high frequency and low frequencies. I don't, you know, the... Uh, Steve, Closest. I know that we talked about some designs that were, because when Steve showed me that slide that showed the dynamic mic and the condenser mic and how the phase was in the, the transient burst and how the phase was out of phase, I, I asked Steve about these combo mics where you have a condenser and a dynamic in them and thinking, how do they get that to work? Isn't there in, you know problems with phase? So maybe you could talk about that a little bit, Steve. Yeah, there's a couple of companies that make those. I think Lewitt makes one. I know Audio Technica makes one. And they put a uh, cardioid condenser capsule and a dynamic capsule in a single housing. It was primarily designed for kick drums. Um, they time and phase align the capsules and each capsule outputs to its own um, its own output, 3-pin XLR. Um, the uh, the idea behind that was, is you wanted the wide frequency response of the condenser microphone to pick up the tonality of the drum shell. And the um, dynamic was there to handle the attack of the beater against the beater head. And the idea was a lot of guys in the live, well, live in studio were putting a plate mic or a boundary mic in the kick drum to get the tone of the shell. And then they were putting like a B52 or a, a D112 or an ATM25 in the in the drum to get the, the smack of the beater on the beater head. As soon as they did that, the spacing was enough that they started to get some phase issues. And so, uh, and it also required two mic stands and, and it, you know, or, or a mic stand and, and it was a mess to do. So they came out with these dual element microphones to get around that. Uh, so it's uh, Audio Technica makes one. I think Lewitt makes one. Uh, they're pretty cool mics. Okay, we have another uh, question. Marcus asks. I, I like Brian. By the way, I like Brian Dorsey's experiment on this. Uh, the uh, on the transparent versus adjacent. Uh, you'll you'll hear less roominess on the adjacent mic because it's less sensitive to the other sound. That's good. Good analogy, Brian. Thank you. 
Marcus asks, I'm a music creator and I have been using a mic with an audio interface. When using the microphone, my S sounds a bit more like shh. Does the audio interface also affect how the mic sounds? And if so, what are the best in the market? The audio interface, I think, does affect how the mic sounds. And I, you know, what are the best on the market? That's a what's your budget? <laughs> I always have to ask that question. I mean, there's some pretty exotic microphones out there. Um, it, it also depends on the mic. You know, I don't know what he's using now, but mic technique may also um, be part of it. Uh, I don't know unless I know more about what he's using. Uh, obviously, a higher quality interface. It's got better preamps in it. That's going to help. Uh, and I don't know what Mikey's using. I'm Steve. Yeah. Um, yes. yeah, this is Marcus. Um, Hi, Marcus. I am, I am using um, this cheap Amazon mic. Um, it's a uh, NW 800 and I'm don't and I don't know because I've been using this mic for quite a while, and I've realized when I was when I was recording raw, it sounded more like shh, mm -hmm. more than s, and I was like wondering what can I do to help fix that because like eq like i have to put the high ends in eq i have to put the high ends really high and there's like more of this background noise that's coming out whenever i record mm -hmm. and i really don't like that well the the sh might be because not to pick on newer products from amazon um but it might be you just have a noisy microphone and what you're hearing in that sh is actually some of the noise of the microphone being uh you know emphasized by the of the s mm. um and that might be what your where the issue is because you've had and it's you say you have to boost the high frequency on your system to get a good clean s sound yeah yeah i'm i'm guessing it's because of the 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 electronics in that the newer is probably a condenser and i'm guessing it's the electronics in that condenser are are adding some some noise that you're you're hearing that sounds like the shh of the s. Hmm. Okay. Uh. Yeah. That actually helps me a lot. Um. I can I can do some research based on that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, feel free to you know send me an email and I can throw some suggestions at you. I mean, there's some some amazing you know hundred dollar USB mics out there that sound phenomenal and for you know music creators and podcasting and and things of that nature. I'm I'm using a inexpensive Focusrite um, Scarlet two input interface that I picked up used, uh, and a lower end AT side address condenser mic is what I'm using here tonight. I don't know how my audio sounds to you guys, but I tested it; it sounded pretty good. Yeah, sounds That's good really to good. me. Um, yeah, I think one thing I would add to that is that. You know, sometimes in audio recording, we have stand like kind of standard mics that we might use, but for vocal recording, it get it's very to taste, and there's a lot of experimentation that you can have when trying to find the kind of perfect match for an individual's voice. So, uh, Marcus, I would encourage you to try to reach out to other audio engineers and just test equipment and listen to how your voice sounds and find that that mic for you. Thank you yeah, so I, much, Greg. Thank you. I always tell vocalists, the microphone is the vocalist's instrument. And they, like a guitar player, is going to go and he's going to find a guitar that plays good, that's comfortable to hold, that's, you know, that feels good in his fingers, et cetera, et cetera. A vocalist um, really needs to try some different microphones. You know, unfortunately, you know, the band comes into the nightclub, for example, and, and, you know how sound is provided and they use whatever mics are on the stage that have been there and and uh um you know you have no idea what kind of shape those mics are in and, and uh not to play on audio technica but if you go to their website and search for um i think it's called get that get your mic or get that mic watch the youtube video on the uh reason why a vocalist should bring their own microphone and, uh, you know, find a microphone that you're comfortable with that sounds good on your, uh, on your voice. Um, Austrian Audio makes a 
pair of handheld vocal microphones, a dynamic and a condenser that have a fairly unique shape on how they get the sound into the backside of the capsule. And I've actually, I did a review on them for front of house magazine and you can cup that microphone and it's not going to, not going to give you problems because of its design. It's one of the few mics I've ever seen that you can actually cup the mic and not have the issues of cupping a mic. So that was one that I'm familiar with. And uh, it's, it was a pretty good, good sounding vocal mic as well. Thank you so much. This actually answers my question and helps all my problems. All right. Um, I'm trying to clarify one of the questions that's in the chat. So um, I don't know if anybody has any other questions for Steve, but please feel free to post them into the chat if. I have a comment, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I uh, I was just gonna say that um, when you were talking about the cupping, um, it reminded me of an engineer I used to know locally who really hated it when people did that. It was just a pet peeve of his. So every time an artist cupped the mic, he would force it to feed back. And then the artist would take his hand off the mic and he'd say, oh, that's great. Just keep your hand off the mic and it'll sound great. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because I think I also like the guy that's on a live sound. I've, I've seen this in some like, uh, I'll say political things where the guy comes up and uh, at a banquet's another one and he he's on a sound system and he wants to get people's attention. So he yells into the microphone thinking it's going to make the sound louder. What he doesn't realize is the sound guy's got that mic on a compressor limiter and as soon as he yells into the microphone, the compressor limiter kicks in and drops his level by 10 dB. And he yells louder and uh, and uh, it just keeps dropping. So, um, but yes, you know, and the other, the other, so we're talking, my, the bane of my existence is, so you're watching television and somebody comes up to any microphone anywhere. And the first thing they do is they go, then they blow into it. Then it squeals, and then they start talking on TV. Why do they do that? We're audio professionals. We got to get them to stop doing that. We have another question for you, Steve. Okay. Um, I think this is referring to a microphone that's in a bi-directional or figure of eight mode. Okay. Um, but the question is, why does the mic sound different? A condenser mic it was the, used in the question, but why is it com does a condenser mic sound different when it's turned around 180 degrees in a bi-directional mode. And maybe also to add to that, like why does a ribbon microphone sometimes sound different on the rear lobe versus the front? The only thing I can think of on the condenser microphone on when it's in, um, if it's in a, if it's a multi-pattern and it's in bi-directional mode, it should sound pretty much the same. Now it might be something because of the mechanical construction of the microphone that might be affecting the sound on the backside slightly. But in any time I've used either any of the ribbons or any of the condenser mics that I've multi-panel condenser mics, I've I've never noticed a difference in sound between front and back. Um, it may be. If you're dealing with two talkers, it might be a loud voice versus a soft voice if one's in front, one's in back. But I've I have never really noticed a difference in in sound. The only thing I can think of is it might be the mechanics of the microphone on a multi-pattern condenser mic because the back side is really not as open as the front side, depending on the the, the mechanics of the housing. So microphone manufacturers, part of this housing, I'm making noise with my mic. Part of that housing design is to minimize acoustic reflections from inside the microphone. In fact, on my RCA 77B, to make it a cardioid, it actually put an acoustic baffle behind the backside of the ribbon assembly, um, which was a uh, which was a way they could make it somewhat directional. I was going to point out that, of course, in a bidirectional microphone, the reverse lobe is the opposite phase of the front lobe. So correct. 
Yeah, so it could be, and I think perhaps Rod may be implying that it could be other signals that may affect your, um, that when summing that signal with other signals, that could affect your perception of how that microphone sounds. So if you inverted the phase on that track, for example. Yeah, it, yeah, it might. I was gonna offer to put up a relative distance sound uh, source to microphone from Sennheiser, if that's of any curiosity uh, to anyone. Uh, if I could be permitted to uh, share the screen, I can have that up in a moment. Uh, Is it? I think you can do that, can't you? No, uh, it says host disabled participating screen. Oh, yeah, sharing. you're right. Go ahead. Shall I try again? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Um, uh, can you see that? Yep. Okay. So that shows the differences between uh, uh, in a in a given room, uh, uh, the relative uh, uh, sound differences between the various directions. Right. That's patterns. the that was the thing that I covered called working distance. Yeah. Okay. So, so so basically, what it's saying is, if I am one foot, and that could be one foot, one meter, whatever. Mm -hmm. From the sound source which is the black dot if i'm one foot from the uh, uh um from the sound source with my omni i can get the same performance by almost 1.7 feet with my cardioid and i can get almost twice the working distance from my sound source with my hypercardioid and and so on and so on, almost two and a half times the working distance. So what they're saying is that the because the as I go to a more directional microphone, I'm starting to now reduce the amount of sound picked up in the off axis part of the mic. So I'm reducing sound on, for lack of better terms, the sides of the microphone. So that's allowing me to get a greater working distance. I showed that in the same thing by going from the cardioid to the hypercardioid with the guy playing the guitar and the monitors example. Um, so it's telling me that in an ideal situation or in the same situation, if I am a foot away from my sound source with my Omni mic, I can be a, almost a foot and a half, almost 1.7 feet away by simply going to a cardio. So I can get a greater working distance. I don't have to be as close to the microphone by doing that. Um, so that's working distance. Okay. Um, I, I can remove my share if um, everyone is satisfied that they've got what, <laughs> what I put up. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions, comments? Well, I had one more that I'd thrown in the chat earlier about uh, microphone preamps. And uh, I'd mentioned something about one of my preamps uh, having a 50 ohm input, okay. which I usually used on the ribbon microphones. And you can't plug a condenser microphone into that because it'll overload it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, I take my ribbon microphone and plug it into some other preamps and uh, uh, can hardly you, hear it. You, you get your background noise kind of coming up, the electrical background noise, the hum and maybe the radio frequency bleeding in from something. And uh, uh, so I, I thought that that was a, an unusual situation. I know that uh, a lot of the ribbon microphones, of course, these days have uh, their own internal amplifiers, which gets Correct. around that problem uh, for most of the contemporary mic preamps. But uh, as I say, the little old uh, MagnaCord PT6, uh, 50 ohms input impedance and 104 dB gain, but you can stand quite a ways back from that microphone <laughs> and still get a good level. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, or it, it surprises me though, though that uh, nobody's really making such a microphone preamp uh, these days. Too. I think Grace Design makes one that'll they'll take a 50 ohm input. But you know, again, the old ribbon mics were designed to feed into a transformer coupled input on a 
RCA or Western Electric Broadcast Console. And I think a lot of those were 50 to 150 ohms. Yeah. So you had this really nice impedance match where a lot of the uh, op amp inputs on modern day mic pre's and channel strips and things um, are much higher impedance. So those ribbon mics appeared lower level coming into those pre's meaning you had to boost the gain input gain trim control which also brought up the noise floor on those on modern pre's thus the cloud lifter and the clark technic piece and the other uh little uh device uh i don't know if west dooley's preamps will do a 50 ohm input or not oh no he's 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 got a high he he runs pretty high impedance pretty high on his and on uh, his things and uh, I had some discussion with him about that, uh, and that he felt that uh, the low the the low impedance loads on a microphone uh, tended to emphasize uh, less desirable resonances uh, mm -hmm. of the microphone. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but but then there was the trade off that uh, well you've got a higher noise floor with a high impedance uh, mm -hmm. loads. So uh, with the, with the old ribbon mics, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I think that's why these the cloud lifter and those things are coming in. They're kind of an impedance matching box um, to help do that, help solve that problem. Well, I know the input impedance of this one preamp that I have, uh, 50 ohms, the transformer, when you look it up in the old catalogs, uh, it's, it says 100 ohms to grid. And in this instance, uh, the 100 ohms is paralleled with another 100 ohm resistor and uh, the the system is uh, has a bridge input, uh, which is part of that. So mm -hmm. the overall microphone input impedance is come becomes fifty ohms under those circumstances. Sure, is it sounds like an old tube preamp? Oh yes, oh yes. Yeah. So yeah, because I have some old Duquesne bridging transformers from the fifties that were part of their pro audio world stuff when I was there yeah um, i just have a little anecdote that i would share my impression is that if you can get enough clean gain out of a mic preamp then you there's no need for any kind of cloud lifter device um, correct so if you are using something like wes's design my friend has a really vast collection of russian vintage uh ribbon microphones mm -hmm. and he uh uses a sphere console and apparently his sphere console has about 80 80 db or 90 db of gain on it really on really, really clean mm -hmm. yeah and i asked him like do you ever try out these mic boosters and he's like nope never never had any use for them no if you've got good a you know, good impedance match on the input and enough clean gain on the preamp the problem is as you know, you start to do make things less and less expensive. There's trade-offs that come into play. Uh, we had another question, interesting question here. Sound Suresh asks, how does a small, small diaphragm pick up low frequencies? The wavelength is more in length. So sort of asking the wavelength's bigger than the diaphragm. How, how is it picking up those low frequencies? What? You know, I, it's, I think even though it's a larger wavelength, it's the amount of motion or movement of the diaphragm that's allowing it to pick those up. The wavelength is going to be longer than any possible microphone diaphragm. Yeah. yeah. It's, that, it's that vibration over time that it's tracing sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that I... I that I don't know. I'm I'm guessing on that one. I, that's it's a, it's an interesting question because I know some really small diaphragm measurement mics. My B and Ks will go down to you know 20 hertz easily. And we'll pick it up and we'll we'll measure it, but um, I I don't know why. Well, I mentioned earlier in one of my. Uh questions i think uh, there are basically two kinds of microphones a uh, pressure microphone and the velocity microphone or otherwise known as a gradient microphone mm -hmm. and uh you combine those and you can get all of your other directional patterns but the pressure microphone is 
base the the ideal would be a an omnidirectional condenser microphone which is like your barometer mm -hmm. uh, for for weather <laughs> measurements mm -hmm. versus the um, ribbon microphone which uh, is more like an anemometer which is measuring your wind velocity the velocity yeah and uh, and the output of that microphone is proportional to the the amount velocity of velocity of the, of the air, air molecules mm -hmm. and uh, so um, uh, and and that's essentially represented by a ribbon microphone so I like the analogy i may steal that and put it in the presentation that's a good idea thank you okay well, I think that that wraps up our questions. So um, I'm going to once again uh, thank Steve Savenu for the wonderful presentation. Uh, really clear. And Steve, you covered a lot of information in a, in a very compact amount of time. So thank well, you so it, much for your expertise and guidance. It, in the live situation, it's a one day master class. And when I do it in a recording school or at a, you know, at a university, where we do the first part of the lecture in the morning, we do some hands-on stuff to do some of these demonstration things. And then we do, we break for lunch. We do the second half, which is miking techniques. And then we mic a band up and record it and play it back and go, why do we do this? And why didn't we do that? And uh, it's a fun class. I, I really want to get back to doing them live again. Uh, you know, as, as we start to come out of the pandemic, I'm not totally willing to do a lot of traveling yet, but uh, I don't want to deal with the airlines mess. And once that clears up, but I will drive to schools in the Midwest. And if the right situation comes up, I'll come out and do it. You know, other places, I bring a case of interesting microphones with me and, and do a hands-on. I ask the school to have something to record. Um, my favorite story is, I, I always ask for as minimum a four piece band, drums, a guitar, bass, and at least a vocalist. Um, I get to um, Shenandoah University, a conservatory, and I walk in and the guy says, well, I've got good news and bad news on the band. And I said, OK, what's the bad news? He says, well, I couldn't get you the four piece rock band. And I've had that happen quite a bit. And the school says, I've got the best singer songwriter in campus that'll come in and play guitar and sing. And I said, well, we'll make it work. He goes, well, I can't get you the rock band. And I said, okay, what's the good news? He says, will you settle for a 17 piece jazz rep group? And I used every microphone I had, plus most of the ones the school had, and we had a blast. And the jazz kids came in and they did a two hour session and, uh, they learned some stuff. I mean, we were doing all kinds of things and they, they even let me tape a plate mic to the lid of the Steinway, the Steinway, Steinway D piano they had. I'm like, okay, let's do it. So, but yeah, I've, it's some, some really the, the in-person classes, Zoom is okay. Um, but the in-person classes, uh, it, it's a lot of fun. So I have a lot of fun with it. So but I thank you very much for having me out and yeah. enjoyed chatting with everybody and uh the thunderstorm did not knock my internet out so that's a good <laughs> thank thing. goodness All right. yeah. okay i'm going to turn thank the time you. over to dan oh mike my uh dr mike did you have something i i was only saying thank you steve and one thing what uh what hall or what uh, is it an orchestra that you frequently record yeah i record the akron symphony and we're in EJ Thomas Hall, which was a, uh, it, it, it's, what do they call the big, massive concrete style of construction, brutalist construction building. Oh, yes. yes. And we have a shell, which is okay. Uh, it's not the greatest. And then they have in the auditorium, this floating ceiling thing that can raise up and down and they can make the hall smaller, make the hall bigger. And supposedly there were panels in the walls that were supposed to move. Well, that's all, that all broke years and years ago. And um, the downside, it's, a, it's an interesting room. The downside of the room is 
to do my mic hang, I used to have to have my A2 clam climb out on top of that floating ceiling thing. And the house uh, manager after they got a new house manager and, and he says, nope, can't do that anymore. So we've got 75 feet of drop to the deck from that hanging cloud thing. So we built these cable winders that'll wind 70 feet of star quad mic cable up into a basket. So there's no slipperings. And I bring in my, my mic lines and fly my deck of tree and outriggers. And it used to take my a two three hours to climb up in there and rig this. And we have this little motor controller thing. And I stand on stage with this little box with switches. And it takes about 20 minutes to drop the mic lines in rig the mics and, trim them out to where they're supposed to be um so it's a it's a fun place i really like doing it um you know i don't do the rock band thing so it's more fun doing the classical and jazz and stuff so hey, mike i like the mics in your background i like the oh. microphones in your background oh there are a few yeah but i mean they're mostly somewhere else <laughs> and the a7s too those are kind of Oh, speaking of mics, if uh, if you're looking to to borrow, uh, you know, a B uh, type uh, ambisonic, let me know. Yeah, I would love to try one. I'd love to try, you know, um, you know, I just uh, I've I can get the plugins. Um, I've got enough tracks in my rig that I could I could I've got four open tracks I could do even with a rig with my full symphony setup. Either that or just take it into my mix pre 10 as for inputs, but I'd love to try one. That'd be a blast to do it. So well, we're Facebook friends. Let me know. Okay. Excellent. As you cool. can see, I put a few put a few toys up on the table behind me. Oh yeah. <laughs> nice. Um I think I'm gonna turn the time over now to Dan to um help move the meeting to the to it to the next phase. And I'll right. I'll hang around in case anybody wants to chat. So great. It's midnight my time, but I don't care. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Steve. And thanks, Greg, for such a great job of moderating. Thank so you. What we, like, what we like to do now is to get to know you and hear what you're up to and what your audio connection is. So I'm going to call on people. And if you have a camera and mic, turn it on. Uh, and if you don't, we'll do our best. Um, so Rod. Where are you and uh, what do you do? Well, I'm in the Portland, Oregon area. I technically live in Milwaukee, Oregon, uh, not to be confused with the other Milwaukee. And I'm doing recording work uh, here in the uh, Portland metropolitan area. Uh, and uh, as soon as this meeting gets over tonight, uh, I have to drag out equipment for a recording I'm doing tomorrow night in a, in a new concert hall over in Beaverton, Oregon, uh, the research center. So that's... Uh, that's what's ahead of me immediately after this. And uh, cool. anyway, that's how, how much do you have to drag out just out of curiosity? Um, a couple of big racks, a case of microphones. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm using a lot of Neumann Solution D. So there's that uh, issue with them. And uh, that's all uh, uh, requiring uh, some computers to control them. So uh, uh, and and the rigging uh, and uh, it's it's a bunch um, uh, maybe maybe 200 pounds of gear <laughs> oh <laughs> great we'll have a good time doing and all that. the cables so yeah thank you let's go to patrick owen uh where are you and uh what's your audio deal Patrick Owen. Okay, Janie, where are you? What are you up to? Uh, Janie Wallach in Seattle, Washington. And uh, I record live music now that there is some again, which is really nice. Um, and yeah, no plans for this particular weekend, but it's nice to have a breather because it's been quite a few in a row already, so <laughs> nice to have a bit of time off. All right, thanks, Janie. Gary Gottlieb, where are you? What are you up to? Hmm. 
Hmm. Okay. Uh, George Matthew, where are you? What are you up to? Interesting. I'm conflicted if I should just kick these people out who don't respond, but uh, we'll let them go. And if they come back later, we'll go for it. Chris Myring, where are you? What are you up to? <laughs> I'm still in Leicester. Just coming up to 5 a.m. here. <laughs> in it's, England. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess I'm used to that after the tea time topics <laughs> going yes. up all night. Um, yes. Yeah, just doing the usual stuff, fixing fixing mic preamps sometimes, like the one that's behind me, the Summit MPC 100. Uh, I got one of those coming in tomorrow, apparently, for repair and some other stuff. Doing loads of Avalon 737s, U5s, all the usual stuff. Um, haven't been out 20 gigs recently, been too busy trying to get through a backlog of work. But uh, yeah, great to uh, have some uh, reminder of uh, what happens in studios and on stage with the miking up. So thanks, Steve. Thanks for that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Camillo? 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 Riva? Where are you and what's your audio connection? Camillo? Nope, okay. Bradley Steinbeck. Can you unmute and tell us what you're up to? Oh, no camera. And the mic is a ways away. Definitely outside at, of working distance. <laughs> I just graduated from Chapman University in Orange County, California with my MFA in sound design. Cool. For film and television, currently looking for work in the is that Orange County area? I have experience with live sound, mainly for local city concerts. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. And uh, I hope you come back again and with a camera and mic closer. Uh, who is next? Avinash Oak? Are you able to talk to us? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, this is Avinash Oak from Mumbai, India. All right. I was um, a sound engineer uh, in uh, Mumbai film industry. Uh, used to record songs for about 40 years. And uh, now I'm an audio educator and uh, go to different institutions uh, all over India and uh, sort of teach sound engineering, whatever I, I know. And Great. thanks for this wonderful session. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and uh, <clears throat> though this is a a very uh, pleasant, uh, not very pleasant morning in Mumbai, but uh, I think uh, at your place it must be evening or maybe the night. So, uh, good evening uh, uh, to all of you. Thank you. We we've noted that you're actually tomorrow relative to us. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you. Thanks. You're welcome. You're welcome, You're welcome, and thank you for joining us. It's great. Yeah. We yeah. we have a guy from New Delhi who joins us on Saturdays. Uh, yeah. A really yeah. Good guy. I, yeah. I would love to join also. Great. Send Jesus. me your. Actually, I've got your email. Do you want me? Yeah. To, do you want me to put you on the list? Yeah, absolutely. I I love that. Yeah, you should. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. And I have your email because I do the event bright, and you needed the email to, re yeah. to get the link. Yeah. So just yeah. for everybody else's knowledge, that's how I've got your email. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, let's go to uh, Mike. Mike Mateski. Um. I'm in Bothell, Washington, which is a suburb of Seattle, for those of you who are not familiar with our fish markets and uh, our neck of the woods. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, have an, I have a recording studio. You can see part of it in the background. Uh, this past week, it's been a little on the busy side. I've recorded five piano concertos, two cello concertos, a, a Haydn cello sonata, 
um, I had to turn down three more pianists. I, I, it, it just the time, you know, and these are all audio video recordings. Um, and in order to do them, it just takes, it just takes some time. But uh, I really enjoy, uh, uh, I enjoyed Steve's presentation. Fascinating hearing people from all over the world. Uh, really cool. And yeah. for those who don't know, Mike also has a lexicon system. And how many mics are buried in the wall, Mike? <laughs> well, actually, there are 72 loudspeakers, but uh, ah, there are only okay. two, okay. two chefs mics. Okay, okay. Uh, we could have had four. We have the electronics for it. But two actually made a little bit better sense. Yeah. And that's the lexicon what? It's the layer system. Lexicon, yeah. acoustical reinforcement and enhancement system. It's uh, kind of a, the brainchild of uh, Dave Griesinger and Steve Barber. Mm, he can make cool. that room sound like any building you want. Very cool. <laughs> you know, the greatest problem, and we have one problem with that whole system. When we, when we utilize it, there are people in universities and elsewhere who simply don't believe that the sound they're hearing could possibly come from what they see, that room. Uh, you know, go figure. Some people hear with their eyes. That's it right. boggles the mind. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I simply ignore that. We just do it anyway. <laughs> now that's in the studio room you have there that we're seeing in your picture. Or is that another room in your facility? No, it's the room that's behind me. Oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. Luke Paholsky, where are you and uh, what's your audio deal? Luke Paholsky, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, by day, I'm a software developer slash sysadmin, but uh, I've been doing just kind of recording as a hobby, uh, recording shows for many years. And for the past 10 plus years, I've been hosting house concerts and doing live sound and recording those and all that type of stuff. And uh, with Dan uh, and uh, Gary, various history of uh, Columbia 30th Street Studio, that type of thing. Cool, thank you. Uh, Greg. Hi, everybody. My name is Greg Dixon, and um, I'm located in Linwood, Washington, which is just north of Seattle. And um, I'm primarily a teacher. I teach at a university in Redmond called DigiPen Institute of Technology, and I'm assistant professor of music and sound design there. Um, there I'm teaching sound design, music, and sound design for video games and um, music composition as well. And outside of teaching, I also do a lot of freelance work when I can. And everything from mixing and mastering, recording. And in fact, just recently, I had a really exciting gig doing uh, technical uh, audio for a Seattle Symphony concert um, where I um, actually developed um, a custom live uh, electronic system for the cello concerto that uh, they just presented by a composer named Esa Pekka Salonen, who's a Finnish composer. And uh, it was really exciting and cool. I, I coded my own um, interactive uh, sound application that made live recordings of the cellist, Nicholas Alstadt and uh, played back loops of those recordings live in surround sound in the, uh, in the hall there. So it's been an exciting couple of weeks and I don't usually do uh, gigs of that, that high caliber of uh, nature and high pressure, but it was a tremendous success. And uh, just a little bit about what I do. Recently also I've been very, very interested in synthesizers and I'm building um, my own modular synthesizer and also building a lot of modular synthesizers from kits and uh, soldering and getting my hands dirty. Um, so thanks for uh, everybody for being here. And I um, also want to just thank Steve again for putting on such a great presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Cool. Congratulations, Greg. That sounds really cool. I'm, I'm remembering that uh, you studied violin with Sherry Kloss. Have you ever, have you heard from her recently? Does she? she I haven't knows? kept in touch with Sherry, unfortunately, but yeah, I am a, a violinist and uh, got a degree in music engineering technology at Ball State. 
um, and then actually a master's in music comp from Ball okay. State. And so um, mutual friend of Rod's and I, she yeah. studied with uh, Yasha Heifetz. Yeah, she, um, she was her, his teaching assistant. Uh, prior to that, uh, she'd uh, studied violin with a fellow by the name of Oleg Kovalenko. Uh, and uh, she pointed out that Oleg is the one who got her that job with Heifetz. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't do much performing, unfortunately, anymore. I've got my violin and viola here, and I haven't, I feel so bad because I just haven't touched them in years. But, and it felt so great to kind of play with a symphony again because it's been so many years and I don't miss the pressure. <laughs> and, you know, playing with the Seattle Symphony was the most high pressure experience I've ever ever had to deal with. Greg, you never mentioned you studied with Sherry. Uh, Sherry, you know, my sister was one of the original seven in I Fitz master class. And of course, Sherry came later. I didn't realize, Mike, that we had that connection. That's cool. I, I, yeah. I didn't apparently, hear from Ball State. A bunch of us too. I've, I've done the live class at Ball State many times. Yeah, that's awesome, Steve. Yeah. I yeah, you know uh, Christoph Thompson. We go in and we set up in one of the sound houses and the kids have a blast. Yeah. I don't know if you ever were there when we had the sound house. It was like off campus, if that might be what you're referring to. I don't know Christoph, but when no, I was going is... to school there, we were in a sound house off campus. So no, crazy. this is the on campus facility. It's actually quite nice. Oh yeah. I've seen it. I actually helped kind of, that was the transition. Yes. Um, I helped kind of set up the studios and stuff mm -hmm. and then unfortunately had to leave and didn't yeah, get to it's, use it's, all the it's cool a fun place. And I, I can drive there. All right, let's go to Gary Louie. Where are you and what are you up to? I'm in Seattle, Washington, and uh, my my normal job is at the University of Washington in Seattle, their, their school of music where I'm the audio guy, um, which which encompasses everything from recording the live uh, concerts to uh, fixing everything that breaks. I'm uh, a Life AES member. I'm secretary of the uh, Pacific Northwest section. I'll leave it at that. All right. And I am uh, the chair of the section for the ninth time in the last 27 years. And I have had my own sound company, Live Sound, for like PA stuff uh, for 49 years. And I mostly do live concerts and other live events. And last Saturday, I got to do sound for our governor, our two senators, uh, Dr. Jill Biden, the president's wife, and an assortment of local politician people for a fundraiser for Patty Murray, our senator's reelection. And uh, day after tomorrow, I'm doing a open house for a private school here whose tuition is more than the University of Washington. Uh, sixth through 12th grades, I think. And uh, one mic at the podium and uh, two inputs from a video player, which will be a thrill a minute and last about nine hours or something. And uh, uh, next week I've got three shows with Earshot Jazz Festival. Uh, they always have really cool things. And then another show with a bluegrass band down in a city 20 miles from here. Or so so um, anybody who I skipped over, like Patrick, who wants to say something? Apparently not. All right. Well, I'm in no hurry to leave. Anybody want to? have a problem they want to solve that the greg, audio talking, problem greg you're talking about the 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 surround thing we just did one of those last week for a guy from a guy from norway bjorn charles dreyer and we had uh he played guitar that he bowed with a violin bow steel guitar and a million effects pedals and then manipulated tracks 
Then he had a melodic percussion guy, a cellist, and then a guy that brought his own mics and sampled the cello and the melodic percussion as well as Bjorn's uh, guitar and steel, pedal steel, live through Ableton and then sent me a left right of that. We put all that in a surround sound. It was really a fascinating concert and cool. kind of fun to do. It was different. Trying wow. to so figure. you were helping with the projection of the sound as yes. well as recording? Uh, strictly projection of the sound. Yeah, and tra we tracked it and we just gave them the tracks and they're doing their own thing with it. But but I did a surround sound system with, you know, front, left, left, right, and rears and an LFE. It was kind of fun. This was a live performance? It's a live performance. And how and did I you monitor the recording? Uh, just We just tracked it. We didn't try and even monitor it. We just said, we'll... We'll track it. Whatever you get, you get. Because they, they didn't hire me to record it. They just hired me to do the live sound part. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I wasn't wasn't about to try and figure out how to monitor that. <laughs> but it was fun because I sat in the audience with an iPad and was, you know, moving stuff around while they were playing. Well, I asked because um, Bayer Dynamics used to make a surround headset. Or a head, mm -hmm. not not headset, but a, a headphone. Mm -hmm. Um and it it had this technology so you could tilt your head and the sound would change or move your head around and oh, it wow. would yeah yeah sadly they don't make it anymore mm. but then again do you really want to spend two grand on a headphone i mean <laughs> there's a lot Janie. there's a lot of companies especially in the video game audio space that are now making head tracking headphone devices at a much cheaper mm -hmm. so you should check those out if you're interested are they specifically for surround yeah they're they're there's a huge boom in the audio industry right now for sort of so-called uh immersive 3d audio the, and it's it's a bit of a wild west it's driven by the gaming community right yeah. and yeah, and Carl. uh metaverse but I yeah there's a lot it. of that happening at, i at wonder the about the fidelity on that but sorry go ahead at, at the avar conference uh, there were a number of booths set up including one by carl heinz brandenburg's company and uh, i think that was the only one i listened to but it was tracking your head with some kind of infrared thing and you, they they played speakers first so that you could hear what was happening and then they put it into the headphones and they, they were transparent headphones so you could hear through them uh, and you couldn't tell the diff I, I couldn't tell the difference and apparently nobody could between what was coming here and what was coming from the speakers with the room around yeah. the speakers. Yep. It, it was, was pretty cool. tracking and actually they were using my speakers. Is that right? Their, their setup and I got tricked. I mean, it was that, you know, I kind of intimately knew what those speakers sounded and yeah, they put them into your headphones and then you're moving around and I can Sounds like it's tell. still coming from there. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Anything else? Has anybody done anything with Atomos? Oh, it's too bad Vebiv wasn't here tonight. <laughs> he has. Yeah. He yeah. attends yeah, our the, uh, tea time topics. Yeah, our Drew guy Katie, from India. Drew Katie, really he was cool. here earlier, and he has a lot of experience with it, but I don't think he's here. No, yeah, there's he's an fine. LA group that I kind of run with a little bit, and and there's some guys that have Atomos rooms, and it's it's that's a lot of stuff, you know. Yeah, I'm about to go down to LA later this month to um, a conference called Game Sound Con. Mm -hmm. It is a mm -hmm. game audio conference and apparently mm -hmm. Dolby has a room there that they are installing an Atmos system yeah. in. So I'm excited to check that out. I just wonder how it's gonna translate to the consumer in, you know, it's hard enough for consumers to put a 5.1 or a 7.1 surround sound system in their living room. 
and do it affordably. So how's that going to translate to the consumer? Or will there be some magic sound bar that'll give you that whole effect? And, you know, if, if I understood what Vebev has told us, the, the Atmos thing is cool because it tracks what you're using and adjusts its mix to fit into mm -hmm. that. So it doesn't matter what the consumer has. It'll yeah. still work. Well, I but know that implies I'll... somebody has a super hundred speaker thing that yeah. makes the point of all the mixing worthwhile. Right. When I was uh, spitting out uh, 5.1 uh, surround proofs on DVD audio disc, uh, the final reference was a $200 Panasonic home theater in the box, which I have in my living room. And uh, it's got to it's got to work on that. Otherwise, I felt I probably didn't do the mix right. But uh... and Bradley points out in the chat that many are using spatial audio through headphones, such as Apple AirPods, Google Pixel yep. Buds, etc. That's yeah. where the ambisonics, I think, is coming into play for the VR stuff. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, to me, it's like because I record so much live music, it's like live music is not heard through headphones typically. Mm -hmm. It's heard in spa in a room, in mm -hmm. a space. And that's how I would like to... That's why I've never gotten into surround as much as I would like to and actually intended to at one point mm -hmm. because I don't have a good monitor monitoring system, nor do I have a good space to put one in. And yeah. I, and I want to hear it in space in a room, so. It seemed like that's where that the Brandenburg system is appropriate because it'll seem like you're in a space. They will synthesize a space with the mm. acoustic character of the room as well as whatever the speaker character is, and be able to. Let what you type hear of that. live stuff do you record? Uh, it's mainly well. It's it's a, a, some world music and also a lot of rock music, to be mm -hmm. honest, and and um, uh, various genres of rock music, mm -hmm. um, pop, um, and you know, but a lot of different. I mean, Brazilian, African. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of kind of across the board in that respect. Do you do you? Sp take splits off of the mics from house sound or do you track off a of house sound i do track off of house sound but i also have um a sure vpn 88 stereo mic that i put up in the room mm -hmm. um with the exception of there's one venue that actually has one mounted in the middle of the venue and if i'm really nice to them they give me a separate board feed of that mic that's nice. So I can, it, it's like I get two tracks of left and right mic, but it's coming from their mic, mm -hmm. which is actually coming as a board feed to me. Yeah. I, most of what I do, I can do in 16 tracks or less with the symphony stuff covers spot mics plus my area hang. But I did one show right before the pandemic started where they brought in these avant garde players that played, I kid you not broken sticks oh, God. wine bottles and metal pipes and they insisted they insisted on close miking five stick players five pipe players and five bottle players oh, geez. plus a bunch of other stuff and i have a 64 channel live console that i can direct out um by usb of all things <laughs> and we took that in just to get enough inputs for it. And it was it was kind of fun seeing console strips labeled sticks and bottles and pipes. <laughs> so we tracked the entire thing and uh, I get it back to mix it down. And I never used any of those ISOs at all. It was all the main hang, picked it up fine. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's something to be say, said about oh. good a good area ensemble miking. Yeah, overhead yeah. miking rules, right? That's the, <laughs> those are the first mics to put up and test 
<laughs> and make sure yeah. and then back yeah. up and then all that other yeah. stuff can happen if you have time exactly and if nothing else to humor the artist <laughs> yeah Yeah, I just put something in the chat. The IEEE uh, Spectrum came out with uh, uh, a deal on the latest mm. doings and uh, surround, if you will, or uh, immersive sound. And uh, uh, they went through all of the Dolby Atmos and a few other uh, mm. dealing with that um, an article. Well, it's an IEEE Spectrum. Okay. If you're familiar with any of that. And uh, anyway, I put a link to uh, a sample. Uh, I'm not seeing it in the chat. Uh, well, let's see. It was the last. Ah, okay. Oh, I didn't send it. There, <laughs> it is. there it is. All right. There it is. Oh, yeah. So um, <laughs> for those who might be curious uh, for what uh, they're trying to come up with as some sort of a standard for that. Uh, area this, of sound uh, <laughs> reproduction, if you will. This ambisonics is kind of new. I've only been kind of digging into it in the last two or three weeks, just because I wanted to talk about th these specialty microphones. But it's, I really want to try some just to see how it works. And the fact that you can do some things in post-production with those a, those a, a formats and the conversions and move some things around that might be really kind of cool well that's been around for some time uh yep. there's the calrec microphone which goes back years and years i mean that's back into the 90s uh right the 80s. and uh but uh then there's the matter of uh you know how do you deal with it in the end i'm wondering chris i mean i know that comes out of great britain <laughs> did you have any close relationship with that operation at all or uh i the guy I used to work with had had one of the sandfields the calrec sandfield i don't remember which mark, mark four or five or something but um the technology was bought by road mm -hmm. in australia they bought the intellectual property because the company struggled it always struggled went through quite a few different ownerships so maybe it was ahead of its time i think with this vr stuff coming into play with the the you know the goggles stuff and the metaverse and the gaming stuff uh and these 360 degree cameras that we're starting to see more of that where they want the spatial audio the surround type audio and then from what i was reading you can emulate some of the traditional area miking techniques with a single um uh ambisonic microphone in one spot or how you move the microphone so it's really kind of i want to dig into it some more that's for sure mm. I have to head out. So yeah, I'm, I'm fading say, quickly here. So yeah, thank it's you, 12 30 in Ohio. All right. Chris what is, is showing Chris us showing? the manual. Uh, so no. Well, actually, no, this is my uh, folder with my notes and uh oh yeah, the sound field. Air jottings for the sand field. Because I yeah, I used to have to repair it even if one time they shut the cable in the sliding door in the studio mm. and I had to splice it. <laughs> that kind of thing that's yeah, that the surround cable right? uh, the surround mic right that's yeah. the ambisonic yeah. yeah the one had 30 capsules in it i just would not even want to think about having to repair that cable <laughs> at microsoft they have like a fourth order one mm -hmm. yeah it's insane it had like i forget how many mics it was like 90 well a third big, order has ball yeah, third order had 38 capsules in it. So, yeah, fourth order is probably a, yeah. <laughs> you have individual a, tracks for each? Yeah, individual tracks for each one. Yeah, we we did a meeting with Microsoft and Ivan Tashev um, 
this must have been six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you go back and you look at the meeting we did with Yvonne, um, you can you might be able to find some information about or documentation about that microphone and pictures of it if you're interested. Wasn't that the uh, uh, what was that game video game that Microsoft had? We did a uh, couple. We've done several meetings with Microsoft, and this one was yeah. in particular about um, 3D or spatial audio, um, and it was not. A particular video game, I think. What? Well, no, it was the system. It was the system that identified talkers. Over yeah, there. I remember that. What was the name of that? They. It was amazing. Oh God. I and they remember. discontinued it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, God, it's well, on the, the tip of my tongue. But in the installed side, I didn't even get into the installed sound world. But in the installed all installed sound world for video conferencing they're looking at these beam forming microphones that um yeah looks like a ceiling panel and it basically knows where the talker is coming from and and can basically key in on that talker and, and reject the rest of the sound except for that one person that's what and this I, thing was that i'm yeah, talking about neumann yeah. zennheiser makes one of those sure yeah. makes one mm -hmm. at makes one um is this the one? Can it, yeah, microphone can Microsoft Connect. Mm -hmm. ah, right. 2000 Connect system. Yeah. Mm, yeah. No, that's before my time. Okay, so it was um, after this. It was. Mm. Okay. Oh, was that the one with where he and JJ did it, and they had these speakers on the wall? Those were that was speakers. It was, it was a line of little diaphragm. Oh, I remember that. That was at Microsoft, right? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't that one, huh? Yeah, and I know it was Yvonne and at Microsoft, so. <laughs> okay. It probably failed because every day it said updating, updating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, should we wrap it? Yeah, let's wrap. Well, it was you, a everybody. pleasure. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you for Steve. having me. I definitely want to come to just come to more of your meetings and be part of it. But I am an Great. AES member. And if anybody within driving distance would like a live one, I do this live as well. So driving distance of where? From uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. So I do us. Ball State and <laughs> I've gone up into Michigan and Pennsylvania and Southern Ohio. Cool. I think we're disqualified. Well, yeah, you know, I wouldn't, as, as I get more comfortable with this, they get this airline thing under control and I would have no issue of flying out to, I like the Northwest. It's a nice area. So. I don't blame you for not wanting to set foot on an airplane right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bradley said, thank you also. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Presentation. Thank you so bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Good night, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye.